Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation Last Stand Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Dagan, good to see you, my friend. Now, quick, this is a kind of an aside, but mm. about Knockback, another show we do together mm-hmm. every other week. That Did you see the, the reception to the mom episode? Of the I show? did. I did. Big response to that episode. <laughs> Big response. We put in We put in <laughs> tens of hours into these video games, and they get half as much traffic as when I just have mom over. <laughs> and plop her down in Micah's space and have her talk to us. Okay, fair enough. My knee jerk reaction was I was a little upset. And then it quickly was like, you should just be happy for your mom. Mm-hmm. And then my third sort of reaction seconds later was like, maybe mom should just take over my spot. I don't know. It might, it might behoove the whole channel. Mom might take over my spot because I have way too many <laughs> things to do. And she wants to retire as well. So we'll get her in there. She does. We'll get this nepotism train really going. <laughs> How are you today, my friend? I'm doing all right. It's great to see everybody. We got most of punching up here, Kyle. I mean, you got to sit in for Gene, and I guess we'll have to accept that. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's true. That's interesting. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Oh, so you guys are very used to being with each other. Yeah. We are. We're getting very comfy. In fact, I just saw a comment. I guess it was on a punching up video on YouTube that Micah looks like Whitney Houston. I don't know if (laughs) if you've seen this. So now I can't get the song... I want to dance with somebody out of my head. I want to dance I with somebody. That's exactly. I just went right to that song. I and now it's been stuck in my head for two with hours. Somebody. Yeah. I, dance with <laughs> I feel like that's her big song, but I also really like the song, uh, How Will I Know? Do you know that oh, one? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Oh. Those are two different songs. <laughs> Dude, she, she rules. Yeah. Oh. Well, she ruled. Was, uh, yeah, R.I.P. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if I realized she was dead. <laughs> oh, dang yeah, it. It's been yeah, it like a, 15 years. Dude, they put the really flags in half long. mass when she died. Did they uh, really? I'm pretty sure because I remember my dad being like, no disrespect, but what the hell? Like, How did I mean, Diana like, Ross outlive? Because I'm just thinking about divas now. Right. Right. The You're divas. thinking about black women. <laughs> thinking about the classic divas. Mm. The beautiful black women that we have. In our in our culture, like how did Diana Ross, who's still alive, hopefully, I feel like I shouldn't jinx it because she's old. How did she outlive Whitney Houston? How did Whitney what? Houston outlive Oprah Winfrey? I mean, let's just start naming all well, the black famous we, women. Well, because um, um, Whitney Houston was on crack. How did so Lizzo I feel outlive? Like that, does do it. that doesn't. How help. did Lizzo outlive Rosa Parks? You know, well, not by a lot. <laughs> she's only like thirty. <laughs> This is getting into a whole thing now. Yeah. All right. Dig. Uh, I show this on sacred symbols, but really the boys don't know anything. You you do. Mike Patelli got me Casey Jones figure. Oh, look at that. That's a NECA. Is yeah. it NECA? Who yeah. does those? Jose Canseco bat. <laughs> you don't tell me you paid money for this. I was saying oh, on the show, the, the best scene in that movie is the Raphael Casey Jones encounter, I think. Oh, in it's the, so in the park. That movie is so. See, that's the stand. I still feel like for classic, I guess NECA sort of um, goes in for this philosophy too. Like that movie is the basis for mainstream, like G1 Ninja Turtle purists. Like Transformers, the movie is the basis for all the masterpiece Transformers. Right. Like that's the Bible. And you're talking about and Transformers, the cartoon, not the, the 2007 cartoon. movie, right? Okay. No, the, the heavy metal, metal intro. Six, yeah. Right? <laughs> that animated 86 movie mm-hmm. with Orson Welles playing the voice when of Optimus Nicron Prime. And all. The, literally all the Transformers die. They all die. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, they Spoilers, but they all die. But and that's still the Bible. It's I love Even that. after all the Michael Bay, like that's still the thing that everything's based around. Right. The whole universe, the toy universe, I guess. The collectible. Yeah, the box said Laird and what's the other guy's name? Um, uh, Eastman and Laird. Eastman and Laird. Like it said it on there. I was like, I didn't even know that. I thought they sold it. You know, I didn't even know. So they're back somehow or they're, I don't know what, what's going on, but. Yeah, Mirage is back in the, in the, one of them was, they had a huge classic falling out and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And one of them was largely just taking the checks and not 
involved and the other one was largely involved, but I always get them confused. Yeah, I, they're from New Hampshire. A very random thing to come from New Hampshire. I don't know if a lot of people know that. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is from New Hampshire, which is not the Turtles. Oh, the Turtles yeah. from New York City, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, dude, I, I it, you know what it was because I, I go back every so often and I did it recently and play the brawler that came out a couple years ago. The, oh, yeah. the Turtles brawler. And it's so, so good. good. It's Great so game. good. Great game. And all of the bosses in it. I'm like, God, dude, I don't even know half these bosses. Like, because I kind of tapped out at some point where right. they have. Like, and, and I'm like, but some of these are it's just Rocksteady and Bebop are so fucking cool, in my opinion. Like, I love them. Love them. So good. Well, did you see the movie, the Seth Rogen? No, I didn't. I haven't seen any of the movies since the the third live action one from 1992, I want to say, or 93. Okay. Right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. It takes it back to that universe just in a cartoonier way, but very purist, cool. you know, from our 80s generation. All right. Well, they're, we're putting these people to sleep. Let's stop. Now. We really are. We really are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, you guys. <laughs> there you Micah that. Moriarty, coordinator, punching up my wife. How are you doing today, beautiful woman? <laughs> oh. Goodness, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm doing quite well. All, all I can think of when you guys talk Ninja Turtles, because I I really didn't like it when I was a kid. But mm. all I think of, and Dustin will appreciate this. There's the picture of is is the pig Bebop? Is that the the pig man? Is a picture yeah. of him just as a cowboy, yeah, and it says Cowboy Bebop. I don't know. Oh. I don't watch anime, <laughs> and it, it gets me every time. But that's all I that's all I think of when you guys start talking Ninja Turtles, because I I don't know. We played the game together. And mm-hmm. it was very fun, mm-hmm. but I don't know what the hell's going on the whole time. <laughs> I really didn't like it when I was a kid. I found them, I don't know, I didn't like it one bit. Something about, I love turtles. I had a pet turtle. But something about those ones just really bothered me. What was his name? Hmm. Oh, Ashton. He was a, uh, Ashton uh, Burnside Ambrose was his name. Uh, he was originally named Ashley, and then I discovered it was a boy turtle, so I had to change its name. Isn't uh, Ambrose Burnside a general from the... Yes, yes, it is. I, well, I loved him when I was a kid. He had great he, progenitor. Do you guys know he's the progenitor of? That's why they're called sideburns. Yes. Oh. No, I never knew that's what because of him. Yeah, Burnside. Yeah, I was a real big fan when I was. I was a weird kid. If you didn't get that, so yeah, that's why yeah. my turtle was named that. And uh yeah, but the Ninja Turtles television program. No, no, none of that. Yeah, Ambrose that's Burnside, cool. I think, is the Civil War general who is the progenitor of the sideburn. Like, yeah. And that's where the name this comes union, from. This union, this marriage is making so much more sense to me just in this yeah. conversation. This, you, yeah, I know. You should hear us sometimes. I mean, I don't even know what we're talking There's about two. half the time, like, or what is going on. We often say, Micah says it more than me, that we share a single brain cell because often we just say the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I'll be about to say something and you'll just say it. Like, I'll be about to make a joke and you just like come right out with it. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, it, it is. We do just share one brain cell between the two of us it's working overtime most days yeah i'm tired boss um <laughs> we're going to dinner tonight that's fun so yeah, nice. it's it's dash's uh our little nephew's birthday and we're gonna, just gonna go to dana's house just for their cake and i'm just gonna give him a card and then we're gonna skedaddle and go to dinner which will be nice just the two of you just guys. the two yeah just the two romantic of them. dinner yeah. candlelit uh no no okay no. um no. Okay. no 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 but it's a nice place chard it's called it's on a on Hull Street, he in Chesterfield, Virginia. Oh, you're going downtown. Oh, I, oh, Hull Street's down by you guys. Yeah, that's yeah. Not, well, Hull Street goes all the way into into Richmond, but that's right. It but feeds it, right but in. We're right? way way outside of it. You you could right. drive all the way on it to Richmond if you want. Dustin Furman, executive producer. You got a haircut? No. No. Oh, I mean, was saying that. Well, who's saying I, that? Oh, I okay. did get a haircut before, like during break. Oh, okay. Uh, but you look like a, like the hair is nice. You know, I feel like you know, a lot of people, let me say this real quick before you, and I'll let you say whatever you need. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of white men with straight hair and I'm jealous of them. They're wearing mid-level Nazi officer haircuts the last few years. And I'm not really entirely sure what that's all about. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you you mean, mean like the shaved it. sides? Yeah. Like it's okay. a good look, but it's like, it's like how Hugo Boss made the Nazi uniforms. We all know they looked great, but right. you can't wear those you know like it's just it's ruined and it's kind of i feel that way at the haircut you know so here's the thing is that the the shaved sides with like the slightly longer on top was very much in style in like 2013 or something like that and uh, i at one point did have that kind of haircut but that was pre like proud boys era oh uh, you know is well set. yeah because at one time i think uh there's a photo of me i think i had that haircut when holly and i got engaged and i think i posted it online at some point and someone was like what's up with that haircut dustin feeling proud yeah. or something i was like 
shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> what, so, but I always tell Fair my enough. barber now, I'm like, don't shave the sides. Just kind of make it even somewhat. I mean, it should be longer on the top, of course, but I don't want the shave sides. But Dagan, you brought up Transformers, the movie. Mm. And I said that it has that amazing heavy metal version of oh, the theme song. The theme song. This reminded me, Holly and I, we like to make lists on like the notes app and we share them and we can like make these lists that have no meaning, but then we'll think of something to add. So the, this list that's related is called songs that go harder than they have any right to. <laughs> and Transformers movie theme is on that list. Some of the other selections, uh, the entire Tarzan soundtrack, Thomas, the tank engine Phil theme, Collins, right? Yeah. Uh, ra- <laughs> reading rainbow theme. Just oh, hell yeah. absolutely when they were fly in the sky. Come on. <laughs> they didn't oh, even go the DMX hard. remix. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh yeah, there is a DMX remix, right? Where it's like, yeah. And there's like Yo, it's the hero flies is up. Wow. <laughs> like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I gotta hear that. It's yeah, so great. funny. I know exactly you what you're talking about. It's so, so funny. It's so funny. Oh. Back to the, I think maybe the haircut thing is that. I, I mentioned this on Sacred. I'm switching over to the in ears so you can see more of my head. Yeah, I think that's, that's ever what, what happened here because I'm the one who said, Dustin, like you got a haircut. And I just saw you a couple days ago, but you didn't look like this. It was yeah. different. You know, this yeah. is one of those Nelson Mandela effects of like, I swear to God, you looked different. That's did, what it yeah. is. It's no clunky Lobot headphones like we have. Mm-hmm. It's like you could see your, you could see right. your head. You could see more. <laughs> I'm going to wear mine like Lobot. <laughs> Dude, that's, all right. this is that's how Usopp in One Piece wears them too. We just like him. Your favorite? <laughs> who? Usopp on uh, One Piece. It took oh, us like five, five minutes. Was to by, like, the guy who did Krillin's voice in Dragon Ball Z. Oh yeah, that's more my speed. I just pretend I never watched Dragon Ball for some reason, even though I was a huge Dragon Ball fan. It just never comes up. Um, me and Mike Pope watching that shit. You can see the pictures of me from 1998, 1999 in my room, just adorned with Dragon Ball posters. It's like, oh my god, what was I doing? Yeah, those were yeah, your posters. Down actually yeah from chinatown and yeah. philly yeah but you watched it on tsunami obviously right, right? when they when they we watched a, i feel like i saw it before that I'm maybe sure on did, vhs yeah. or something but yeah right. in like the mid 90s they started playing it on cartoon network and everyone got that was like the first generation of like the weeb like the, the mm, progenitor yeah. of the weeb, the prototype mm-hmm. yeah yeah and dragon ball gt was out in japan already when they started playing dragon ball z on american television and that was like to my consternation, I was like, you guys don't even know. Like, this is already Dragon Ball Z. It's like old hat, you know, like that. Yeah. I was like, the, you know, the snobbish weeb that already knew like this is. I think they retconned it. I think they totally oh, yeah. said that's GT true. is out now that Super is available. Yeah, so. Right. That's right. I forgot about Super. How is that? Is that good? I've never seen it. I never said uh, it, so. it was pretty good. I stopped watching it partly because the first season, so much of it is recap from the like the previous two movies that I'd already seen. Oh. So I was like, well, I'm going to I'll watch it once they get past the movies, because they basically took a one hour movie and turned it into 20 episodes of television. And then I just never got back into it. But it was good. I liked it. That's it a common pretty. thing now is like that's what they did with Demon Slayers. They made a movie and the next season they spent 10 episodes recapping the movie. And they're going like to do that, that with Chainsaw Man. Yeah, then that overlap is frustrating for fans. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. But I guess that's kind of like it's a lower lift, right? You can make more money on product that's already, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. By the way, speaking mm-hmm. of cartoons, anime, it's not really anime, but Mike and I have been watching Castlevania and we're in the third season. Why is that so fucking good? It's a great show. What is, what is up with that? Like, it's just so good. And yeah, I don't understand why Konami that really- allowed that to be good. <laughs> They had they had nothing to do with it. They just took it from it's it's powerhouse animation. And are they in Austin? They're they in Austin. Galveston. They're somewhere in Texas, right? They're those guys just have a vision. They're connected to the IP. They're very reverent, but it's also the level of quality for, for you know. I hate to say it, but for a Western studio, and there's other big anime like Western studios that do a great job, like The Line, and those guys. But you know, this is one of the first. How how many seasons deep are they? There, it's four seasons of Castlevania, and then there's another series. But I haven't even seen the other oh, a spinoff, series? like a Castlevania something. I don't uh, even Nocturne, know that. I think it's called. Oh but, right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. But I told you that Adi Shankar. I think that's how you say his name. I've I've only spoken to him via text or via via DM. But he's like he listens to us or knows me in some way, and who's the that's producer incredible. of that. And we've gone back and forth before. Hmm. And I was thinking about reaching out to him 
to see if we want he wanted to do an episode on that because I think it's funny like it doesn't really reference the old games very much that's what I was telling Mike I was like in the first season those first four episodes there are a lot of references and Sypha and Trevor are obviously a reference to Castlevania 3 and Alucard right but they don't really I was telling her I'm like there are not really any iconic in, in my experience so far like where are the iconic enemies or they just use like general undead enemies and dragons and un- skull skeletons and stuff. And that's cool, had... but yeah. that's the one thing that's missing. And but I also think that you don't really need any of that. Like I can imagine people really like it without any context. And it's just so the writing is just really sublimely good. Like I can't believe how good the writing is. The way that the, the the way they talk and just the European feel of it, the Eastern European feel of it. So that's what's so special. It's very about rare. You know? Yeah, it's rare for something to be that kind of. Yeah, just the the quality is just in every aspect. And the castle know? itself, like the the I was saying, Micah, the, the Castlevania is the impossible castle, right? And they, I, I kept telling her, I'm like, look, they get it. Look how much they get it. Like when they do, like when they show it and all that, I'm like, they really get it. Like they're like me and Dagan. It's as if like <laughs> me and Dagan are making it. Yeah, I generation. love the castle, which is the impossible turrets and like the, and they just go further and further off and they really can't be supported that way. And it's just all supernatural and weird. So God, oh my God. <laughs> they just get it that's the thing you, they just get it we gotta get a game man in this style i can't believe that they wouldn't do a game like this with maybe this, with this is, maybe it's in the office sort of style anyway yeah. yeah let's get into the show shall we my friends mm-hmm. i want to go first this week i have a, a somewhat brief topic but i thought it would be interesting so we have a listener james solar who wrote to me and he's just listening to the shows and I, I, apropos of nothing, I guess it started kind of keeping statistics on the shows. I don't know if he's running this stuff through AI or whatever to figure out some of this stuff, but uh, he's done some pretty hard work here and sent me a document. I can actually, I don't know if I can share it with you. I think I can, if you guys want to see it here, I'm going to put that, it in yeah. the link. It's a Google cheat. I'll put it in the chat. So he sent me this stuff where it's like a full list of all of the topics we've done on the show so far how much everyone's been on the show, how much everyone's been on the show with each other analysis of how much time we've taken on the shows and all the rest. And I thought this was pretty interesting. So I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to go through this and say, first of all, James, thank you for your hard work. Some interesting stats though. I've been on it the most 53 times on constellation digging. I guess you missed two episodes because you've been on 51 times. It says it looks like you missed episode 28 and 31. Okay, I thought I missed one, but that could that must be right. And on those episodes, we had Micah, Dustin, and Ben, and Gene, Micah, and me only. Mm-hmm. And the episodes without you are the shortest episodes that we've ever done of Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Um, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you think... I want you to always be on the show, but do you think I should also always be on the show? Or do you think I should start ducking out and letting more people come on the show, like more combinations of people? The only reason I've ever thought of that is knowing how busy you are with everything, especially sacred, which is still, well, until Brad came along, right? It was like our bread and butter. Yeah, Brad's got to take it easy a little bit, huh? (laughs) (laughs) But that's the only reason I've ever thought of that. Because I do think of it as you and I and then the other people coming in in a rotating form and it's a satellite thing. And, you know, I have to I have to say, first of all, to James, like that's the ultimate like you putting this together for us is the ultimate compliment for me. That's the ultimate currency. Like that's the payoff. Like somebody likes the show enough to take the time to do this is just thank you. Like that's so cool. But, yeah, that's the only reason I've ever thought of that, Kyle. That's what I love about this show is that. You know, it's a rotating cast of personalities and it's a it's a whole different permutation depending on who's on, right? That it, it could be a different it's a different look with each show depending on who who's on that week. And that's the neat thing. But I like having that dynamic with the anchored dynamic as well. You know, it's kind of the best of both worlds. You know what you're you kind of know what you're getting a little bit, but then there's also something fresh every week as well you know if you're tired of me and colin you could look forward to the other two or three people that are going to be on you know that type of thing yeah i think that i'll generally be on the show but i think i might if if i'm feeling stressed or whatever on certain weeks we might we might set it up a different way the one thing i want to do because the reason i wanted to do this topic was not only to share the statistics because i thought they were interesting but to talk a little bit about the future of the show and like what 
how I kind of see it going is I want to do, and I wonder how you feel about this, Dagan, and, and the others can speak too, because actually the statistics show that this combination is the most used combination. This has happened 19 times, apparently. Oh. Um, or is that true? No, I think I'm misreading the stats. I don't know. I'm Let not me see. Hold on a second. Bad. Dustin has been on 20 times. Micah has been on 19. So that doesn't necessarily mean you guys have been on together. together. So that's right. not necessarily true. Okay. But this is, I think, the most used combination, which is totally fine. But I, I, so, Dave, let me ask you this first and we can go around the horn since we have mm. our coordinator and our producer here. It's actually kind of useful. This is actually a, a really um, convenient and appropriate combination of people is should we theme episodes more? So one thing I had mentioned to you, I think, briefly last year was I like the idea of even going and just making a random episode of Constellation, like an, a review of a movie or something or just thoughts on uh, something that had happened um, or an event or whatever, as opposed because we did the marriage episode and a few other episodes or like the live show episode where it's like things that are, are, are associated with that, which is one type of episode we could do. But we could do this other type of episode where we just talk about one thing specifically. How do you feel about that? Either aiming it at a film or an event or whatever. I love that idea. I mean, I love putting that into the mix. It doesn't always have to be that way. I remember talking about that with you as we closed out 2023 and talking about that with you guys, even, you know, in starting the show over a year ago, like that's a possibility to sort of anchor the show around a similar theme and let everybody have a take. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth a shot at least, not only in terms of how our listeners and how those Steli devotees react to it, but also see how much fun we have with it. You know, see how it, see how we gel with that as well. And if we enjoy it, you know, and of course how people react to it. And I think a lot of this is, you know, based around the personalities and stories and anecdotes and fun topics and maybe a, a cross of dramatic or more serious topics. But yeah, basing it around a, a theme could be fun to kind of anchor it in something specific. But even in that, people don't have to be tied down to like you're saying, even have some variety in that. You know, if we're talking about a movie, maybe I'm talking about the cinematography, Mike is talking about the acting, whatever, however everybody wants to bring it so they could personalize it. So the people that are on don't have to feel like, oh, I'm kind of restricted to talk about this. It could still be personalized from each person. Because I think that's the thing is everybody's, that's what I enjoy about doing the show. I don't listen to it. I can't listen to myself. But no, what I either. enjoy about <laughs> doing the show is everybody's genuine take. It's just Dustin being Dustin. It's Micah being Micah. It's Cog being Cog. It's, and it's that sort of um, rotation of personalities and the way we all interact. That's the fun part. So you can still do that around a common theme, no matter you know if that's a TV series or a movie or whatever we're talking about. I also want to do, and this is kind of a half step, but I already emailed Micah about this earlier in the week to try to get these together, is I want to do like focused topical episodes. Like I want to do a political episode with Gene and Jaffe. But I want it to be and I was and I, I pitched it just as a political episode, but I'd really love it to be like third rail, like let's get in trouble sort of sort of episode. Like let's talk about the topics like no one would ever touch sort of thing. I think that would be hysterical and fun. And I had a sports podcast that because like Maddie and Cog are the only other sports fans other than me and you dig really that focus on sports more broadly. Micah's in the sports, too. Sure. But I don't know how comfortable she would really want to be talking about the ins and outs of like the NHL or something. I don't know if she would enjoy that or whatever. So she would be possible for that, too. And then music was another one where maybe Ramon and it could be a lot of different people, but maybe even Finn McKenty could be on that. And then the, the one we talked about, which mm -hmm. was Star Wars, where we could get together and really just. I'm so ready for that episode. And that I already pitched as Gene and Brad. And I think a lot of other people could could be in on that as well. So we'll keep those going. But Dustin, I want to go to you. Where how are you feeling about the show a, a year in? What do you think about these statistics? Anything interesting strike you? For people that are curious, Dustin's been on 20 times. So we've yeah. done, what is this, the 54th episode, I think? So I've been on all of them. Dagan has been on all of them, but two. Dustin's been on 20. Mike has been on 19. Chris has been on 12. Ben and Gene have both been on 11 times. Okay. And then Jaffe and Maddie have both been on eight times. Okay. And then Ramon has been on three times. Lockmore has been on twice, and then we have three one guest one appearances, which is Jimmy Champagne, Finn McKenty, and Brad. Okay, that covers it. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dustin, with all of this knowledge in mind, now, I mean, how are you feeling? What what should we do? How is the show doing? I'm I'm happy with it personally. I think it's it's just kind of fun, and it it, it serves an appropriate service for our audience of 
getting the kind of the nonsense out a little bit, although it doesn't really help sacred symbols. Maybe it helps the other shows a little bit. And so what are your thoughts? I think so. First of all, seeing that I've I am the right ahead of Micah by one episode on the most. And uh, that's probably a bad thing. I think I should probably be on this show less now. To be clear, I think the reason why I'm on the show have been on the show more than anyone else. And Micah also fulfill this role that it's like no one else can go. No, no one else is available yeah. who's of the full time people who can do it. So that's why I think why Micah and I are pretty much tied of like the most appearances. But I think uh, being able to uh, have more people filter in regularly would be great. Um, I think that's the the one thing in particular. But uh, I think last year at the end of the year, we started to touch on something good with uh, occasional guests. Mm -hmm. And I think initially uh, I didn't know if that would be a good idea uh, just because we're you, you never know when you introduce a new person, even if it's just for an episode, if you know whether or not people like it or not, if people only want to hear from us. But all of the episodes that we've had additional people on have all been highly well received, especially if we have that person on and they're talking about something that is kind of in their particular wheelhouse. Right. So I'm curious about looking into other people, not necessarily someone we don't know completely, because I think that that might not work with the episode. But at least if one person has a good touchstone with this person then it could really work like even uh you know thinking about finn and uh having jimmy and lockmore dude lockmore maybe he's the untapped potential here because the two episodes he's been on are people highly highly like them they were yeah even awesome yeah, the comments they love cool. lockmore so yeah yeah figuring out uh more people that we can tap into to bring into onto the show the single topic idea I think it's a good idea. This is what my my expected feedback is, is there are people that will complain if they don't like the single topic that they have to skip. Is that valid feedback? Not really. No, I'm just saying that's what that will be. The comment is like, well, I didn't care about uh, Oppenheimer and I don't need to listen to four hours about or something. And at that right. point, too, if it is about a movie, then is it just a spoiler cast? And not yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, that's what I'm kind of saying is like, could Constellation be something more than just this, like where it could yeah. subsume that sort of not a need for a spoiler cast or whatever or for like non games media, but it could be that, too. And it, it, the, the, the thing I lament the most is that we just don't have more sports fandom in the in the, uh, in the company because it's one thing that I think is truly untapped, like to really be able to talk about the NFL playoffs as a topic or the Super Bowl as a topic or, you know, NIL as a topic. Like it's, it's kind of a bummer that I've, I, I attract talent that doesn't really care about sports <laughs> with the exception of a couple of people who really can speak about it at a high level. And I think that that's one thing that I would really, really love to explore more. The good news is that Dagan can roll in those conversations. And so the next time that Maddie and Cog are on together, like I definitely want to do a sports episode. Yeah, With Kyle, that. you know yeah. what, though? I could also two things that I want to say. I could in that situation, too, I'd be happy to defer a few times a year, too, if you're going to have Maddie and or Cog and then you could bring on that rotating cast. Maybe it's somebody Ramon new. would be good for that episode, for instance, for Ramon. sports. But you could always bring in that third chair and I would just sit out, you know, for those sport episodes and at least see like that's part of the conversation, too. Like, all right, look at Last Stand Media, right? Something I've realized from very early on, I'm very curious to get Micah's take on this whole thing too, but when we started Knockback, it was already, you know, it was always, it was always smaller and sort of a, a dedicated but very cultish and much smaller niche following. And it became very obvious to me very quickly that partially because it's Colin, I think, but people from Last Day Media look at it, right? People want video games. They want video game talk, right? Look at Constellation. I mean, look at um, sacred symbols and now look at everything with summon sign. So everything else is in some way additive or an extra. So I think the cool part about that, the positive, it even is something I think um, mildly successful like Constellation, there's not, you could play, you could afford to play and experiment a little bit because you already know your bread and butter is taken care of. 
the other stuff are it's it's the also rans in some way, not in a bad way, but in a way that we could get the positives out of that by playing around and seeing what works and experimenting experimenting with the topics and the chemistry of various iterations of people. So that's um that's something that I think as long as we still maintain that following and people are largely happy with the show and the conversations and the humor and again that chemistry, that's one thing that's been really cool about doing this for a straight year is that no matter what the iterations of people, the chemistry is always so good. We're very fortunate, I think, with the personalities and the way everybody works together in tandem. It's really neat. Right. So, but that's the thing, like you could afford to kind of, you guys could afford to Kyle from your leadership perspective and Dustin as, you know, higher up in the food chain in terms of production, like you guys could really assess what's working and, and, and fiddle with it a little bit. <clears throat> well, I think you could do that and still, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you could do that and still not have to feel like you, you know, the caught co- you, you know, the bottom line is going to be taken care of. Right. Because you're still, you still got sacred. You still got Duke. You still got Brad doing some and sign, making you guys look foolish. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, it's funny because I, and I've said this before where, the company could be reduced down to just sacred symbols and probably be pretty okay. It would have to obviously change materially in a lot of different ways, but everything we do around sacred symbols is really a way to try to garner more attention, more revenue, whatever from the focal flagship audience, right? And to convince them that things around it are good too. And we've done that in such, such the point now, now we have people, you know, many people listening to our stuff that don't listen to sacred symbols that listen to other things. And so it's working. So I think that you're right. And just being able to experiment around, but Michael, let's get you in here as the coordinator, getting all these people onto the roster, plus um, a participant, in, a, a regular participant in our show. I'm wondering how you feel about it and how we might improve it. Yeah, so I think the show has done really well over the past year. I do. I see the feedback that like I'm on it too much and I'm sorry. It it really is just I'm here a lot. And if someone calls out or cancels, I, I'm intentionally home on Fridays for the possibility of that happening. And I always have a topic ready, right? Oh, wow. So I it's just one of those that. things of like, yeah, I see a lot of complaints that I'm on too much. But it's also like, well, we could roll with less people if that would be preferred because it just happens a lot that we have cancellations and and whatnot. And that's kind of just where I fit in. But no, I I think in terms of like the topic, like variety, the variety of like people we've been able to have on, you know, I see a lot of like positive, you know, feedback from the audience. And of course, I mean, everybody like fell in love with Gene and Jaffe, you know, like we've had these combinations of people that like you know, everybody, like Dagan said, everyone gets along really well and works well together. And then you do just have some combinations that people just like really gravitate towards those episodes, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I, I definitely think like leaning more into that and pulling on people's strengths in terms of, yeah, I do think it'd be a good idea to just have a politics episode. And on the one hand, you have people who already skip an episode. If there's one political topic in it, they'll skip the whole episode. So we may as well just do an episode focused solely around politics because they're going to skip it anyways if they don't want it. Like that's the reality is people will skip the whole thing because of one topic they don't want to hear. So it's like, well, yeah, let's have an episode like that with people who have strong political opinions and they want to talk about it because it also leaves people like me out of it who don't have anything to say about politics, really. You know, it's like instead of having me be in that episode and I don't have much to say really just cater that to here's two people that want to talk about it and same with something like yeah doing a star wars themed episode something that our community is very passionate about whenever star wars gets mentioned so (laughs) i don't think these are bad ideas at all and it's certainly not something we do every single week but doing a themed episode every couple weeks i think would be great and also just in terms of you know setting those up just takes a little bit of pressure off people of coming up with a topic, you know, so consistently because looking at James uh, list, which shout out to James, we talk barbecue a lot. James and I, this nice. is somebody I, I chat with, you know, periodically. So it's just excellent person, but we do have um, topics that I won't say are like repeats necessarily, but we do take like a topic and then we'll put like a different spin on it. And the conversation is always different because we just have, 
different guests. But this would give just an opportunity for people to kind of reset a little bit, come up with more ideas for next time. I keep, like I keep a running list in my phone of like constellation topics. Like if oh, I wow. think of something, write it down. So I'll come back to it later. And that makes it easy for me to just always be prepared if I'm like called on because somebody canceled. But it's also just like I realize it can be stressful for people to always have to come up with something. So giving them a little bit of a break of like, hey, today's episode is going to be sports, you know, something that like we, the two people will call on super passionate about. And, you know, I think that would just make it a little less stressful for everybody involved to have breaks like that, you know, periodically. Yeah. Constellation wasn't supposed to be weekly either. It right? was not. That's right. It was not. And I remember when we made this decision and I, I panicked greatly inside <laughs> and I was like, oh, this isn't what I this isn't good. I mean, we've oh, made it poor work. You. We've I have to do all the episodes. Poor you. Uh, oh, poor yeah. And it's like hurting that's... cats. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah. Hurting and it's like hurting cats. cats to get these people on the show. <laughs> oh, let's like, get her a fainting look. chair. Okay. Colin resorts to calling people sensitive. So that's where yes, this is Colin what's happening. Colin calls people sensitive because he makes an executive decision without talking to anyone else who works here first. Like, yes, we all we all agreed that this should be a weekly show. And it's like, no, we didn't. <laughs> well, it was so popular that we because I'm looking at the dates. That's why we're off a little bit, because we so I was like, the numbers don't quite add up to 52, I guess, episodes or whatever. But right. we did one January 2nd and then we did another one January 23rd. And it was at that point that we decided to do it weekly starting oh, February 1st, right. 8th, 15th, 22. So there's only two episodes in January of 2023. I mean, I feel like I do have, I mean, you guys can disagree with me if you want and please openly disagree. I have no problem with it at all. Um, but I feel like I do actually keep an eye out on or try to note people's workloads to keep them. To, you're never going to work for another person that tells you that you should work as little as possible. And like, let's try to get this done as little as possible. So I don't feel <laughs> particularly bad about adding this show because I think it was good for the audience. and. Um. It made sense. Like we don't I, I don't like biweekly shows unless we have biweekly shows that can that can switch off with each other, which we do now with knockback and punching up. But I even wonder, like I've been thinking about punching up. I'm like, I could see punching up going weekly, not in the near term, but in the midterm. Certainly, mm. <laughs> you know, interesting. Well, I mean, That's the new switch is going to be huge. Why it's would you want to talk about that every other week? You know, because we're not all crazy. Not all of us want to be run into the ground. Not all of us want to wake up feeling like we're dead inside. Some but, of us want to just wake up and feel like I'm ready to go to work today. But but maybe. But maybe we take if that happens, then maybe we say, like, OK, now Constellation and Knockback go back and forth. And we have because this makes more sense for the audience at that time. Like I would be eager to not go that that distance between shows if I had a new product to talk about. I do understand it now because there ain't dick all to talk about Nintendo, although I can right. make a weekly show work on Nintendo. There's no doubt. But and I think we all could. It's just a matter of like, is you the audience work, interested? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, right. But in that new switch environment, like when that switch gets an, announced and then everything leading up to that into launch and all that every other week. I mean, that's going to be I, I want to see what, how you guys feel about that at that time. I feel like I'd be the dude with the, the meme with the guy with the vein. <laughs> you would be you would be that's how you operate yeah dustin you don't feel i that like that you're considering oh, the sorry, possibilities. Take, no 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 i was just saying i really like that you're it's it's a little bit of outside the box thinking like you're considering all the possibilities and future possible iterations and i think that's a good i think that's a good train of thought and again i think it's i think with a show like constellation which is modestly successful. I say modestly successful. I'm very, you know, very grateful for every listener. Do you that know, we all get. of our podcasts are within the top 1,200 most listened to podcasts on iTunes. No, mm. I didn't know that. According really? to Chartable, however That's accurate incredible. or whatever that is, like they're all in that chart. Yeah. That's insane. <clears throat> but, you know, of course I'm comparing it to the, to the meat, the meat and potatoes, sacred symbols, right? So the fact that it has enough success to warrant keeping it going. But the fact that we're still in that mode of like, we feel there's a, there's a modicum of fearlessness with, okay, we could, we could try out, at least try new things. There is a, we still have to appease an audience, we still have to consider the bottom line. But I like that kind of energy of like, you know, we're still in that, in that mode where I guess we're finding our footing and, and figuring out what the show is. 
or at least entertaining the possibilities of, you know, what it could be. Because, you know, when I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but when I think of my favorite personalities online and otherwise, there is something really cool about hearing them talk about the things that they have expertise in, right? You want to hear Colin talk about video games. You know, I, I talk about film or animation, or whatever, but it's really nice to see those people have conversations outside of those spaces to really get a slice of what those people are because people are fans of Sacred Symbols because they're fans of Dustin, Chris, and Colin. Not just you guys as video gamers, but of you guys as people. So to me, that's what Constellation embodies. It's like, it's the people show. It's just everybody being a person. Sometimes we talk about that nerdy shit and sometimes we don't, but it's, it's really more about the person in that space, right? Jaffe may talk about God of War, but he may talk about, you know, you know, like hanging out in his hot tub or, you know, talking about hot tub gaming or whatever hot takes Jaffe has that week. You know what I mean? So it's, it's really about being a fan of Jaffe, not being a fan of Jaffe, the video game creator, right? That's what I love about Constellation, you know? And, and also like, I have to say, like, I, I think you do an amazing job on the show. I think you're, I think you're a natural podcaster. Oh, you know, I don't you. know, you know, if I if I'm the one to be giving you that uh, <laughs> praise means a lot, but for me, it's like you fit right in with everybody else. Yeah, I agree. The, the I haven't sh- even seen that that kind of sentiment. No, I, I I would be very sensitive to Auntie Micah sentiments, considering she's my wife, especially. Um, oh, there's a lot. I don't it's, see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being I honest with you. <laughs> I don't. I see shit about you the least amount by far. I mean, it's mostly I'm not, about me. I see it. It's, but it's I often see about. It. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, no, I'm saying I see it because I moderate our communities, which is part of my job. So mm-hmm. I read I read every single Reddit post and every single Reddit comment that we get. A lot of those end up getting like deleted because people like call them out on it. So like later on, if you go look, you won't see it. But it's like I read every single comment on Facebook, Reddit, whatever, because it's part of my job. So I do end up just seeing a lot of the feedback of like how much people don't like me. But it's also just like, well, fuck it. You're paying me to do this. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> but also you can't pay attention to this is something everyone learns and you know it inherently. Although even though we know it intuitively, we have to live it long enough to be able for it to become natural is. You can't you have to simply focus on the number, whatever the whatever the important number is, whether it's it's monetary or in traffic or watch time or whatever. And think about and really our KPI on YouTube is watch time. I don't really care about views. We make money on watch time. Um, so I that and that's why we do long form. Well, we, that's not why we do long form content, content, but I think we actually do pretty well on YouTube considering how few views we get there overall because how long people watch the stuff. Um, but you have to realize like how many people I keep saying sacred symbols is as if the amount of people that listen to sacred symbols, an episode of sacred symbols would fill um, where the cowboys play every week. Right now, think about incredible. W- think about uh, even just a section like of one of a hundred sections hating you there. They're the away fans or whatever. It's like, dude, look at all the people that are here for you. I try to really think about that when I see negative comments, not only about me, but about other people too. Cause it's hard for me to read. Like a lot of people are very hard on Ramon, which bothers me a little bit. Really? I haven't seen that either. Because Ramon's a little wordy too, but he meanders, but that's kind of the way he, he gets through things. And I know him and I know how smart and interesting he is. And I'm like, I feel like you have to just kind of be exposed to that a little bit more, but I am sensitive to that. And I am just being honest. I'm not just saying it like, I guess you see it and people are deleting it or whatever, but I really, most of what I see is about me. And well, then yes, I you're would, on the show is the most. Well, no, I know. But what I'm saying is I draw the most ire and then I feel like it would be Chris after that. And then <laughs> maybe Dagan after that. And then like Dustin, you don't really see very much about in my, in my experience, you don't see much about Ben. Everyone loves Gene. Jaffe is one that is like very, Jaffe's a guest where people, a lot of people don't want him on the show. And I don't, I couldn't get careless about that. He's going to be on the show for as long as he wants to be on the show. I think he's an amazing person and a really interesting person, but it's funny to see how people react. You have to just kind of put your blinders on and do the product. And the thing mm. I want to say about punching up, and I really want to know what you think about this, Dustin, about going every week eventually or how you look at the future of the show is I think of two things. Number one is I really defer on uh, to other people's instincts in many different ways about what should be done and how things are done and how things are work in this space. I listen to me, right? Like in the podcast space, I helped build the three biggest PlayStation podcasts in the world. Um, 
And so my intuition says about punching up that you will never beat your competition until you do it every week. Whether or not that that's something you care about or whatever is another thing entirely, but you cannot win doing it twice a month. Now, the important thing to me, though, about looking at that product is it's not really relevant if it wins. Same thing with um, someone signs not really comp- comp- competing with anything, but defining Duke like. Maddie's hard on himself or has been in the past hard on himself about how the show's not doing better. And it's like, dude, I don't really care. Like it serves its audience. It's the Xbox space is incredibly crowded for some reason. And mm. um, you're doing a great job with punching up. It's another experiment. But if, if you were to ask me, like, what do we do to make the show grow? It's like, well, what, what you need to do is obvious. It's whether or not you guys want to do it or not. And the important thing is, is that it's not really relevant to me. So you can do whatever you want. But that's just my advice. Dustin, do you have any thoughts? So you're asking me, do I think that punching up should go twice? No, no, no. Uh, well, not now, but I'm saying like when yeah. there is something to talk about, like, wouldn't you feel that eagerness to say more? Like, I couldn't imagine not doing sacred. Like, well, we did it over the holidays where I was like, I was the dude with the vein when the insomniac stuff came out. I'm like, how can we not be talking about this right now? <laughs> yeah, you know? I had to talk you off the ledge for that. I know I was you didn't. Like, I, we're I, I, not I, doing this. And I appreciate that. But at the same time, it's like that is why sacred symbols dominates. That that mentality is the reason. I mean, it's completely true. So. I wonder what you think about that with your in terms of your own show as you grow it. I think it probably is true that it could be beneficial to go weekly. Um, My fear would be that even with big news sections, there would still be times when uh, it would be really tough just because you might go another two or three weeks without news. And Nintendo is uh, I mean, it would require scoping out the show to be much more broad. Like Nintendo, our show right now, I could talk and bring up all the third party releases and we could talk about those as well, but we don't because we really try to keep it focused in on mostly Nintendo first party and other stuff that is more relevant to switch exclusive. So I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, I think the thing that would be tough for me is that we would need to figure out like 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 right now the the recording schedule like this week i recorded four times this week and that's okay and i'm okay with recording four times a week um in addition to the production and stuff it's just me being on that is going to make it harder for me to be on sacred symbols plus to and to be on summon sign potentially Mm -hmm. um even if it's just a simple scheduling thing um, and then too, it's also the commitment if everyone, everyone else on the show, like, I don't know if Gene would want to do it. Yeah. I be, again, there's really, I'm just free flowing and talking. I have no expectations. That's just where my mind is. I, what I really see as being the, what would end up happening maybe is like there being a concession where there would be another episode if something happened or like, I wouldn't want you to wait if they were like, oh, here's the new switch. And then you had to wait 10 days. It's like, no, I don't think so. That seems like a really bad idea. You know? Oh yeah. Um, so at that point, yeah. my idea would be like for you to just t- subsume knockbacks place, like just go twice in a row. And then we just keep going back and forth from that point. But it's your show. I mean, the thing about punching up is that I don't we built this without the hardcore Nintendo fan base, the, like mm-hmm. the, this this company. I don't really think we they're almost a different. They're, there's a lot of crossover, but they're almost like in a different world with very legacy brand. Um outlets still very website heavy in the nintendo space still lots of you know lots of very popular youtubers that have been doing it for a long time like my old colleagues um at ign that that what what is that uh game explain um as an example yeah yeah Yeah. you know i used to work with andre who is the founder of that we were both guides writers at ign together and so yeah that's that dance with punching up and constellation knockback, all these things kind of work around each other in such a way where I, I want it to be as low impact on people as possible, but also serve the audience. The one thing I do know is that I don't want more. And I think we have settled into this like six pieces of content a week. I think is great. I think it's perfect. Actually. Oh, okay. It's very yeah, yeah. AM radio, you know? Um, People are like, how can there be so much content? And I'm like, dude, when I was like a landscaper, I'd listen to fucking AMs, the same people on AM sports radio from like eight to two. Yeah. Five days a week. Five days a week. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, it's like, yeah. I, I don't, I think some people just miss that whole era or weren't, or weren't into that thing. I'm like, this is actually way less content than what we used to get back then. Sans ads too. I mean, it used to be every, fu- I know all these, you know, 1-800-588-2300. 2300 300 em- empire. empire. It's like all these things. <laughs> 1-800 cars for kids. 
C A R S cars for a kid. You know, it's like, oh my god, it's all because we don't even have that. We could start doing wow. that. Kids can drive in New York. It was like a thing where it was like you <laughs> yeah, would give do. your car to this this um, agency, and they would. It, it's like a it's like a charity, and then you would get yeah, uh, yeah, a tax. tax and they would give it to a kid, and then they yeah. would give it to a kid, and they would get into it, and they would get into a Dewey. <laughs> Kids <laughs> loved it. <laughs> By the way, Kyle, Dave, you know, I think oh, oh, it's no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just to you know, I think it really is forward thinking because Nintendo's at the top of their game. We talk about that on on PU all the time, and this is going to be a big year for them at some point. We're in the quiet before the storm, like we just said on the show, but it's gonna it's gonna be worth thinking about. I mean, I think too. I think it's almost unfair for me to weigh in on this because a I'm a bigger Nintendo fan than anything else in gaming, and b I find them as people that listen to Punching Up know deeply fascinating as a company like i am so fascinated in nintendo the way they run things and just how they're sort of still they're they're so big but so enigmatic there's very few companies like that also not only for that but also for their content like i could definitely see doing a weekly show also because like what we talked about going in and launching punching up is that there's the retro angle and there's the modern contemporary angle so there's a lot to pull from and then, of course, them becoming an entertainment entity, entity now with movies and toys. We never get into like what's going on with them in Lego. And I'm not even sure how much of that is fascinating to a general Nintendo-centric audience. But it's going to be, have you guys even considered, I'm sure you have, but the in-between iteration, which would be a punching up plus you know, like doing that extra episode, still staying bi-weekly or twice a month, but doing that extra 12 episodes a year or something when something's, when it's a specifically newsworthy era. I'm loath to do any more plus style shows because the one that didn't have me involved in it, what became difficult to get done with people's schedules, you know? So... That's, I mean, Defining Duke Ultimate wasn't performing very well, but also it was just becoming an increasing problem to get everyone together to do it. I think that there's voluminous things that Defining Duke Ultimate could have been about. Um, hmm. I think it, that there's so much news on the Xbox side that it's a shame that we don't really have a show like that because it's actually much more newsworthy on that side right now than PlayStation, and it's been that way for several years. But you have to have hosts that have the time to do it, and I'd rather not squeeze cog and maddie at the edges and make them more stressed out Smart. than they probably already are especially because it's in the four of us well no that's actually not true three of the four of us not including dagan really this is like our job right dagan this is a big part of dagan's job but he has other things that he does too obviously and i try to keep that in mind when i think of maddie cog gene whatever where it's like this is and brad is another example of this where like brad most brad's job is part-time right it's like right, and i right. want it to stay that way so that you can explore all these other avenues and do your thing in all these other different ways because i do think that that's part of what keeps people happy like maddie and cog i don't think would be if maddie wasn't doing his <clears throat> his youtube content and cog wasn't doing iron lords i don't think that they would be complete in some way so you have to give them time to be able to do those things so yeah like a plus style episode for punching up i think is a non-starter for me just because I think it would inevitably be canceled. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. You don't want to, that's the other thing. It, it takes, well, you guys know how it takes careful consideration because you don't want to start something only to stop it weeks in. Yeah. We don't cancel shows typically. So, I mean, Defining Duke Ultimate is really the second show we've ever removed. Um, if you, if you count Side Quest, which is not really a podcast, which, that would be three, but mm, Fireside Chats that. and which I, I, sure. I've said before, I don't consider Fireside Chats totally dead. I just consider it dormant i mean maybe we would do it again i think it was a fun show to do but no plans for that right now and that would have to take something else's place again you know like and uh i like the idea of cycling things in and out seasonally almost but in the in the meantime i think it's more punching up would have to get to a weekly podcast and then build into something that would be really reliable to where we would even do a supplemental episode for it i think but I, I don't think it ever gets there until you do that every every week episode. But it's important mm -hmm. for me to note and underline again that I don't really it's I care. I would love for you guys to be the biggest thing in Nintendo. I think that'd be fucking awesome. But I don't really care because the company's not really de dependent on it. It's punching up's a compliment, right? It's not really the core stuff. I don't think that we probably have many subscribers for that content first. It would be like if you it would be like multi-tiered voting, 
you, you would probably see that second, third, fourth, and that's really important because it's supplemental. Right. It's the same thing with knockback and why we don't cancel knockback. Knockback doesn't do great, but we know that our audience cares about it. Like it's clear that if we did, if we canceled it, it would be bad for the audience. And that's why we don't look at views per se, especially on YouTube as a KPI for us, but rather, you know, what, um, you know, Patreon really, what drives Patreon. That's why I, what's going on on Patreon right now with more than 13,500 paying subscribers. It's actually 13,600 as of today paying subscribers. Wow. That's, you guys are getting there. That, Holy so shit. we've gone up about four or 500 since we added Brad. That's the Bradley Ellis effect. Mm-hmm. Is it not? It's yeah. gotta be. All right. Let's, I oh, I'm sorry. Two ahead, ideas, go. though, for yep. for Constellation that I want to throw out there. Yeah, sure. Since oh, we're what? talking about experimental stuff. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> two sides of the same coin. Uh, Constellation, wild card. The wild card, this is kind of you talking about maybe if Colin and Dagan weren't on an episode. What if maybe not once a month, once a quarterly, the wild card episode is for random people that are not Dagan and Colin. And then you guys get a little break. I, I love it, dude. Honestly, I'm fucking shot in the head so badly that if you told me that I didn't have to do a podcast every once in a while, that'd be awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, cause, cause then you could get real weird with like the, the permutations of, of people, you know, for people from all the different shows that, you know, would never have podcasted together otherwise. So that's the first, uh, wild card idea. The second wild card idea this one is very crazy. No topic episode. Yeah, I love that too. No topics at all. You can maybe come with a few loose ideas of things to talk about, but just hit record and go. No, I love that. I think that, that that's a great idea too. Micah, you made a face before though. I want to revisit. What, what was that? You made a face about 30 seconds ago. You, you, you looked nonplussed. Oh, I'm just scoffing at you being like, I'm so shot. And it's like, well, this is the man who decided the show was going to be weekly. I just want everyone to be very clear that Colin simultaneously get Micah fainting couch for saying the show shouldn't have been weekly. And also, I'm so fucking shot because this show is weekly. <laughs> and I want everyone to know that it's all his decision at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. You're a little meaner to me than 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 usual Am on I? this podcast. That's yeah. wife energy. Yeah, yeah. That's that's every wife. That's not Micah. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, believe a little, me. A little bit of like an aggressiveness. Uh, now Dustin called it out that it is your thing of like, oh, you're being sensitive. And it's like, OK, buddy. Yes. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> I got to say, I'm going to be fair to Micah. She's in a little bit of a state this week because. It started Bill, with the Roomba, right? Well, oh, you heard about I that. heard about the Roomba. What happened to the Roomba? What was, oh, Micah, was that when we had our meeting on Monday? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. The snack. Roomba yeah, Roomba ate an entire shit again, but I don't know what Colin's <laughs> talking about. I thought I was having a good week. Well, I was going to get into it. I, I think you'll understand in a second, but the Roomba story first is that this is our second Roomba that we've had to throw away now because it ran over Treble's yeah. poop. Oh, and, man. Sorry, we got disconnected. So anyway, the Roomba, we had this Roomba, Roomba-san, and it ran over the poop three different times. And so we eventually like were like, we can't clean this thing because you have to like really take it apart. Use I was using toothpicks. And it was fucking gross, oh. right? Oh. No, it, it's really bad. And the one thing I want to say, it depending on how bad the poop was itself is how like the first time it ran over a poop, it ran over a poop like the size of a dime. And it was like, well, that's unfortunate, but that wasn't so bad. And then it did it again. And it was like an entire log. OK, and it was like, well, this is worse. And then it, it just escalated from there. So we got we threw that Roomba out and then we waited a little while to get another one because I, I just had observed over the years that every prime day <laughs> there is like a half off Roomba, like a real Roomba, oh, an iRobot Roomba. I don't good. know why it's always just on there. So it's like, lo and behold, room, prime day comes. We get another one. I name it Dustman from Mega Man 4. We put Brilliant. it back where it is. It's doing its work. And then we wake up. I guess earlier this week from when we're recording and it's just totally disabled behind our kitchen table, just having, having run over like multiple logs of shit. And <laughs> so we just, Micah texts me cause I get up way later than her and she texts me like there's like an emergent, like a poop emergency in the kitchen. And I'm like, so I, I think it's a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Poop disaster in the emergency. And I came down and so I, we helped clean it up and eventually we were working, like cleaning all the poop and like got closer and closer to the Roomba itself that was disabled and we flip it over and it was just, horrifying and i'm like we're just throwing this thing out but the funny the funniest thing the funniest thing about this is i threw it in the garbage not thinking about it and then i went back out there to like bring it out to the we had to bring our garbage to the side of the road and the Roomba still had a charge in it so you could hear inside the it was very sad almost like it was like 
reconnect to the you know to the to the charger or like all that kind of stuff like very calmly as like we're bringing it out it's just gonna go and and often die so we'll have to wait maybe for prime day to get another room because we we are it they work really well but yeah but this is a problem you know no because treble should step up it's never rush it's treble it's treble shit that seems to be i don't now, Roomba should step up their tech game because I'm sure this is a fairly common problem. But I don't, guys. I got to be honest. I don't know if the Roomba is the problem. I think it's the dog shitting oh, on the what? floor. Yeah. You got to go to the core. Well, we Rebel. just don't notice. You know, like well, we. Got. She's like borderline. I don't want to say she's incontinent. Treble is a very small dog. She was the runt of the litter. <laughs> she mm. is undersized. She literally just suddenly has to poop. Rush will. Rush has to poop. He goes to the door. He barks. We let him out. Treble will be sitting on the couch and then suddenly just start pooping. Like, and I will take her out every <laughs> like three hours. Like yeah, she's yeah. a puppy still. It really just hits her so suddenly that she can't hold it even to like get outside. It just happens. So we're in the habit of always looking for poop before we go to bed. But like one night we forget that's the night it happened. Because <laughs> normally we walk around, we pick up all the dog toys, the so room doesn't run them over. And then also just do a scan. Because it really is like Treble is potty trained. It just hits her so suddenly that she just can't hold it. And like she never pees in the house. It's only this. Mm. But I don't I don't know like it's if like there's I any fix it. for that, honestly. Like she's going to be three this summer. And mm. she just will suddenly jump off the couch and just start shitting. So, you know, aside and again, from she me doesn't pee in the like house, thank God. Like, <laughs> she doesn't pee in the house, thank God. Yeah, that no. would be because like, I yeah, would, that would murder, murder her if she did. She never, she never does. So, it, pooping on the hardwood floor is like not a big deal, but it is a big deal when, <laughs> when Roomba comes around. But that is not the reason I was talking about. I'm like, oh, what I was saying, you're having a bad week. I guess you're not necessarily is a the the retire or the the quitting of Bill Belichick from the Patriots after 24 oh, years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody's <clears throat> bringing this up a lot. <laughs> Did he quit or was he fired? Well, it was like a mutual parting. Of okay. Ways, it seems like. And they already have a new coach, I, so you're good to go. You know? Yeah, well, I'm disappointed. I'm annoyed that people keep telling me how I should feel about it. And that's the only thing that's annoying me this week is everyone's like, you should be thrilled. And it's like, well, I'm not. I mean, yeah, I hope next season goes well. I I agree that he shouldn't have been the GM anymore, but it's still like a bummer, right? It's like when Chara left the Bruins and it's like, was Chara like really slow at that point and like shouldn't have been playing anymore? Like, yeah, but I didn't want to see him go to another team. I kind of would have preferred Bill to just like retire. Like selfishly, I'm just like, just retire. But I also didn't want to see it end like that. Like we lost to the fucking Jets for our last game with Belichick. Like that sucks. So <laughs> no, I'm not thrilled about it, but I'm that more sucks. annoyed with people keep telling me how happy I should be. And it's like, well, I hope your coach dies. How about that? Wow, Jesus. I hope, I hope your coach, not you, but you know, people keep telling me, oh, you should be so happy about it. It's like, I hope your quarterback hits his head really hard and your coach falls off an escalator. Wow. If you're gonna, and then you'll be happy about that. Well, I didn't realize it was quite that deep. We were, we were, I was showing Micah a picture yesterday and it was like, uh, has your NFL team made, made the playoffs since Steve Jobs died? And then it was, it was all the <laughs> logos of the NFL teams on one side and then the Jets under the, the no, because they haven't even been in the playoffs in all those, in all these years. Um, I am thrilled that this happened because I think it's, I think it will ultimately be much more interesting for the Patriots now. Like, no, I, and yeah, you're right. People have been telling you that. I've, I've been talking to your dad about about it. And I'm like, dude, I would be so amped if I were you guys right now. You're getting new everything. You're going to get a new you have a new coach now. You're going to get a new GM and you're going to get a new QB. Potentially one of the great QBs in college football. You're picking third. You know, I mean, I would be so fucking amped if I was picking third in this draft. We're picking 10th and we're arguably worse than you. <laughs> it's probably just hard to shut the book on like an era right it's not nostalgia necessarily but it's like it's the way you guys have known it for so long oh yeah and, I and, mean, and the winning obviously bill's been the coach since what 2000 mm -hmm. i was seven years old wow. like bill belichick's been the coach for like the majority of my life yeah it is just weird it's the same as when tom brady left and it's like I'm not so much sad as it's just like, it's really weird, man. This guy's been the quarterback most of my life. It's very strange. 
And, you know, same thing as like the Achara leaving the Bruins. It's just like, man, this guy's been just a huge part of my sports watching for so long. It'll be the same when some of my favorite announcers retire. My favorite ref retired last year uh, in the NFL, Jerome Boger. I was very, I just, I was like, where's Jerome? I watched week after week. He's not there. I go on his Wikipedia. He retired. I was very upset. So Hmm. it's just, it's just one of those things of like, yeah, I'm just a very, I don't know. I like routine. I like habits. And I'm sad that my favorite ref's gone. Favorite coach's leaving. It's uh, it's just not great. I get it. I definitely get it. I tuned out from the Yankees when Jeter left. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, a a lot of us did. It was like, it's never going to be this good anymore. Or when when Tory left. I think it's a more that's another an, one analogous. That was heartbreaking. I, yeah, I have something to contribute to the sports conversation. Yeah. Mm. I had a reminder this morning. But your NFL teams don't have a a song uh, like the Steelers do. I heard the song this morning. Do you know the Steelers "Here We Go" song? No, oh, some teams do have songs, but I don't. I don't know the Steelers song. No. Oh, what, it sounds it like it was. It sounds like drunk guys in a parking lot. Uh, <laughs> going here we go like that. Uh, you know, you've never heard this? No, I don't I think so. I know the Five Eagles. Fingers I know the... and one for the thumb. Here we go. No, I, don't <laughs> think I, I don't think I, I, I I'm going to because I know the, it's I know the cultural Eagles... touchstone in well, Pittsburgh. <laughs> I was going to say, I know the Eagles song because the Eagles song is really catchy. Where it's like, hit them high. No, it's like, hit them low, fly. hit them high, fly, Eagles, fly. You know, it's like, it's, it's like very, very good. But the, the Jets have a chant. We don't have a song. Mm. The, Patri- the Patriots, I've been to quite a few Patriots games. I don't think they have anything they really sing there. No? I don't know. I've never been to one. Yeah. Well, we'll go soon enough. But I understand the way you feel. I don't understand the way. I, I do understand the way you feel. It is kind of like when Joe Torre left the Yankees in some way. Because it's this man that, dude, you guys won six Super Bowls with him. Six. I know. It was great. And you went to my eight. Life. Eight yeah. Super Bowls. Was- went to eight. Wow. That's incredible. I have not seen a Super Bowl with the Jets in my entire life. They've been they went to the Super Bowl one time 55 years ago. And what you guys went hear about Belichick eight times. He's I can't the believe third, that. the what third winningest co- football. Yeah, yeah, coach he's the third winningest. I think he's like just behind Shula and Landry, though. Yeah. I think he could do it. That's incredible. He absolutely could if he was on a better team. Like he he doesn't need that many wins to cross over Don Shula. Um it should have been in, like they kept talking about it the two years ago. Of like, oh, you know, he'll beat Don Shula's record. And then the Patriots have been so bad these past two years. It's like they stopped talking about it. They just stopped mentioning it because they, they knew he wasn't going to get there. Mm. Well, anyway, we'll leave it there. And by this with the Steelers, I mean, this will go up after that had already happened. So we'll, they might have won or lost. I don't know. But they're in the playoffs this weekend. So, oh, yeah, it's it's ramping up when I yeah. check on Facebook, which. My Facebook is exclusively for local slash people I re- know in real life, and uh, it's heating up. There will be, uh, you know, Sunday you'll see people ever, people going to church wearing their uh, their jerseys, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be crazy. Where who are uh, they playing? Uh, I don't the even Steelers know. were set the seventh seed, right? So I don't even know in my head who they're playing. Dude, it's it's going to bother I, me. I was thinking because I heard this song this morning. Uh, the here we go song and I thought man I don't even know who the Steelers quarterback is anymore now that it's not Ben Roethlisberger I'm right. like yeah I don't, oh, I, don't I can't name a single player on the Steelers anymore oh they're at the Bills no. oh that's right that's yeah this game is Googled this game going to be I this was the game I was reading about I was showing Mike before this game is apparently going to be in like negative 40 degree wow like wind chills style and like sanity like holy shit winter storm warning they were looking to maybe even move the game to cleveland apparently so yeah wow uh, pretty interesting yeah that that'll be we are we have bills fans in our family on our sister dana's husband is from rochester in upstate new york and they're huge bills fans so his boys are bills fans too so they're really engaged i think that the bills are on the decline i but i think the steelers are not it the steelers are maybe the worst playoff 10 and 7 team i've ever seen in my life actually to be perfect to be perfectly honest with you, but we'll see. I'm just jealous. You're jealous of the pirates too. I know. I'm, I'm jealous of the butt pirates, especially. Dude, the butt pirates. <laughs> and the, That's they, what we the, got. Vibe, the vibe in Philly a little different. The Eagles are also playing this weekend. The Eagles. Mm-hmm. Do you know the Eagles were ten and one, and then finished? Oh yeah. 11, no, how can I not? Know? How then, can I not? But then they finished eleven and six. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But that's very. That's a. That's Philly sports energy. I really feel I'm not a Philly sports fan, but I really and I, you know, I love my city, but I, I think these people have to deal with 
the card they're dealt. Like this is just how it is going to be here. It's not just the Eagles. It's the Phillies. It's the Flyers. It's uh, it's this really. It's it's the whole Philadelphia vibe of a little bit of being in the shadow of New York, right? That that kind of what do you call that? Napoleon uh, complex. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, same, yeah, same difference. Yeah, just feeling like a little inadequacy. Right. It's a big city, but just it's not a big city when it's 100 miles from New York. Like Phil, take Philadelphia anywhere else and put it, you know, somewhere else in the country. That's the that's the that's the shit. That's the metropolitan area. But you can't be that close to New York and still feel like, you know, they're always going to play second fiddle to, to NYC. Right. Because just the proximity and that's the whole energy. That's the whole trickle down effect with Philly sports, I think. Just kind of being feeling like you're second. You're always second banana. I remember your neighbor in your old neighborhood at your old house had like the big eagles blow up dude in his front yard yeah you know, like the it was like the big blow the up inflatable lawn the inflatable lawn thing of like an eagles player and he like had it on his on his lawn i was like what is going on here all right dig let's uh, i consider micah and dustin's uh topics linked mm. in a patriots like way so let's Could see that um let's stick with you instead dig and we'll go into our second topic now yeah i wanted to hit you guys with the feel good one today and i just like I emailed, I just wanted to talk about good deeds. You know, mm. do, be a doer of good deeds. Have you been a recipient of good deeds? And like I said to you guys, when I wrote, you know, I just feel, I feel like when I'm talking about good deeds, it's just doing something kind for somebody else without the promise of reward, right? Just doing something nice and, and kind out of the goodness of your heart. And I, I realized as I was thinking about this topic, I was like, wow, I kind of think about this pretty often because I love cars, right? But I'm not a gearhead in any sense of the word. Like, I just don't know much about the inner workings of the internal combustion engine. Dad tried to impart his mechanic skills on me when I was a kid, just wasn't interested. So I love cars, but I don't really understand how they work. Like, I could change the oil on a four-cylinder car. That's as far as I could get. But When you're out and about in a big metropolitan area in a big suburb like me, what do you see when you're driving around? You see people stranded on the side of the road, whether it's a flat tire or something more serious. And I think for a long time, I've been like, wow, it would be so nice to pull over and help this person, but I would just make matters worse. Like there's no, I have no skill to do that. So that's always been a big lament of mine. Like if I just knew something about cars, I could help this poor lady on the side of the road or this gentleman so they don't have to wait for AAA or roadside assistance, right? I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with roadside assistance. I don't want to make this a roadside assistance topic, but Helene has Subaru roadside assistance. I have a plan through, through Audi for my roadside assistance. I've had AAA in the past. I had an incident like two years ago where my battery died in my daughter's dancing school parking lot. And my roadside assistance had to come. It took forever. So wouldn't it be nice to just be able to help people, give people a jump, you know, have the jumper cables in the car? But I really, I'm, I'm, I'm useless with that kind of thing. So the other day, I'm pulling into the, to the shopping center. I'm just going to do a little bit of food shopping. And it's not like I'm constantly thinking about how can I do a good deed? But I see this old lady and she's coming out of the store and she's loading the groceries into the trunk of her car. But I mean, she's like old, like this lady's like 85 if she's a day, right? She's old. She's got her cane. She's kind of trembling and shaking. She could barely get the stuff into her car. She's just finishing up. And I already have a cart. I take a cart from the corral. I try to be considerate, right? These kids out here working hard, getting the carts together. So I just take a cart in so I don't have to get one from the curb. I'm just, I'm helping. I'm taking one more for the kids, right? So I already have a cart, but I see she's kind of looking around like the cart corral for her is nowhere near. She's far away from the front of the store. So she's kind of figuring out where she's going to put her shopping cart so she could leave. So I'm like, ma'am, I'm going that way. I'll take the cart. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm literally going in. Like, I'll take your cart. So here I am, idiot with two shopping carts trying to maneuver. But I just want to help this lady even though I already have a cart. So I just help her out. And you know what? I wasn't rescuing anybody from a burning building or something, but it just felt nice. You know, it just felt good to help somebody 
maybe I made, I, I just made a little difference in this old lady's life. Right. And then I just got to thinking like, wouldn't it be so cool to be able to kind of do something like that every day? Because it just feels great. It just feels really good. It just, it gave me, it gave me a shot of energy that I needed in my life right now. Right. And it's funny because that night I was listening to a podcast and a story came on about this dude. I thought this was absolutely fascinating. So there was this dude recently in Seattle and he was looking to buy a used bike for his wife. So he went onto Craigslist and was looking through whatever it was, mountain bikes or something and came across an ad for a bike on sale that was really sketchy. Like it was like really shady photography, like kind of like unexposed shot in the dark. You couldn't even see the bike hastily scrawled message with all kinds of spelling mistakes. And he's like, okay, this bike, there's something, there's something wrong with this. And found, went online and found that Seattle has this database that if your bike is stolen, you could file it with the, in this internet index. And then people could, you basically file a complaint. So if people come across your bike, you could get your bike back maybe, although it's a, it's a long shot, right? So this guy finds out about this, you know, this catalog and cross indexes the bike. And sure enough, thinks he, find, he found this, it's a stolen bike. So he gets in touch with this person who filed the missing bike report and says, I found your bike. It's on Craigslist. I'm going to get it back for you. And she's like, you know, they get in touch and they're emailing. She's like, oh no, don't, you know, put yourself in harm's way or whatever. He's like, no, I'm getting the bike back. So this complete stranger goes to, you know, answers the Craigslist ad. I'm interested in your bike, meets these shady dudes. And basically is like, listen, I know it. You know, I know it. This bike is stolen. Luckily, the dudes just, you know, he, he lies to the guy, said, I called the cops. They're on their way. He really didn't. Luckily, these three thugs just run when he threatens them with the police, takes the bike, gives it to the woman feels great about it. Woman wants to give him a reward. He's like, no reward necessary. Now, this guy's not a cop. He's just some random Seattle office worker, just a white collar dude, right? And then because he felt so good, he just started doing this. He started using Craigslist and this missing bike index to get people stolen bikes for them just because he's like, he just wanted to do something good. He wanted to do something helpful. You know, it's like Batman. And this is like a little side hustle for You're him at the night, bike man. Yeah, bike man. <laughs> I think yeah, he's well, gonna get set up. By yeah, the they're gonna get. Yeah, he's gonna get, he's gonna get set up by some Joker like ba- bike syndicate. You know, yeah. somebody yeah. is gonna be onto this guy for sure. But I was like, wow, this guy's not doing this for money. This guy's not, just doing this for the sheer pleasure of helping people. And I was like, wow, how do I get a little bit of that? A little more of that into my life. I remember. In our neighboring little town, our little town of Doylestown out here, there was somebody going around, which I always thought was so cool, and feeding the meter for people. Uh, before meters were like, you know, the parking apps and use your credit mm. card. He was just going in and putting the quarter in for people. And I thought that that was so cool because you're just being a random hero. Most of the time, people aren't going to see you doing yeah, it. Yeah, unsung. It's completely anonymous, right? Yep. You're just the unsung hero. But what a selfless gesture. Not only are you using your own money to help people out in that case, but also you're just doing it to just to help your fellow man, you know. So anyway, all a, a, a sort of a collection, a conglomeration of all those stories got me to thinking: how do I, how do I get a little bit of that good deed energy into my life? And I just wanted to say, pass it on to you guys and see: have you have you done a good deed? Have has somebody, you know, maybe you're maybe you were changing a flat on the side of the road and someone came along and helped you, Micah. However you want to take this, good deeds however you want yeah no i definitely dig and i appreciate the sentiment uh there are times like i feel like you want to help somebody but for me particularly it's like even if i know how to do something it's like well i'm a a very short small woman and i don't want to get kidnapped and i (laughs) i hate that that has to be like my worldview but it's like you see a guy with you know with the hood up and they need to jump and it's like well you're a man and i'm five four and I'm going to drive away because I don't want to get murdered. But it just is like, yeah, there are many times it's like, yeah, I, I would want to help this person, but it doesn't feel safe to do so. So for me, good deeds are often 
I, I try to compliment people. Like, you know, if I see like, oh, the, the cashier like has a nice hairstyle. And this isn't something I do constantly, but it's like, you know, sometimes you could just tell somebody seems like a little down and be like, oh, your hair looks really nice. And they'll be like, you can tell like their whole demeanor changes. And suddenly they're like checking your things out with like a smile on, you know, like just or like uh, the lady at the pharmacy, for example, I know her because I, I just, you know, I've seen this woman f- for a couple of years now. And like, I'll tell her like if she gets a haircut or something and like she's genuinely happy to hear it, you know. So I try to do things like that, you know, or be like, oh, cool shoes, man. Like people, people like that, and, you know, it just seems to make a difference in people's day. So I try to do small things like that because it's kind of what I can do, right? Because no, I don't feel comfortable helping someone jumpstart their car, regardless of if I like can do so it's like i'm just not comfortable getting into that situation right but small things yeah helping somebody take their cart back if they're old or just always putting your own cart back you know those small things but like we have talked about um being very short i am the person at the grocery store who needs help getting things off the top shelf for example and i hate asking people for help and so often I'm at the store and there's nobody around. So I just leave without the thing I wanted because oh, so I can't find anybody to help me. And it's like, it's where I try to like build up my good boy points of like, look, I'm going to try and do all these nice things so that when I have to ask for help, I don't feel as, as guilty about it. Because when I need, you know, the, the my sparkling water is on the top shelf and I can't reach it. And I have to ask some random tall gentleman to assist, you know, but it's I try to just do those small things because that's what I'm capable of, essentially. Um, and I, I guess some of the stuff like, yeah, I know what you mean. Seeing people like put quarters in the meter and I'm like, I'm not giving you guys my money. You know, I just <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much of it myself, honestly, man. So but I appreciate like those little things. It reminds me, though, Dustin, of um, the I think you should leave when he tries to start the pay it forward. And then he oh. like gets back in line to order like fifty five burgers. Oh my god! Yeah, I go so, good. so good. Stop! I'm so trying to do good. a thing. I'm Stop. trying to do something. <laughs> and like I've never been part of one of those pay it forward things, and I'm so glad because it's like, well, dude, if all I wanted was a donut and a medium iced coffee, and the guy behind me is getting like four things, it's like I didn't sign up for this. Like I would absolutely be the person to break it because like I just wanted to spend my five dollars. Like, don't do this to me. Don't do well, this to me. Here's the thing about pay it forward, Micah, that I don't yeah. understand is that I see this when uh when Holly worked at the coffee shop and bakery. I would go in sometimes in the morning before I drive to work. Now it happened to me once in a while. Mm-hmm. And I never understood the pay it forward right now. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Where it's like, OK, so we're just kind of all it's almost like Christmas. We're all just kind of buying each other stuff. We're all getting each other things and we're all kind of net zero at the end. So some people might think this is rude, but I would never pay it forward because I'd be like, oh, cool. Someone did something nice for me. (laughs) And then at some other point, I'm going to do something nice. But it's like if I do it right now is it doesn't that never translated to me like pay forward say another time. Yeah, you're reciprocating weird? in that case instead of no, doing it. No, I'm, I'm yeah. on board with that because I think the whole random act of kindness thing is supposed to be a random act of kindness and not random. that I've started a chain reaction. Random, right. Like, it does seem like a nice thing to be like, I'm going to pay for the guy behind me. And what I would want is for the guy behind me to be like, oh, thanks, that was real nice of you, and drive away. Like, don't, because I do also know that the cashiers often, like, hate it because it just complicates things and they have to keep telling you the man paid for you. Like, and it's a whole thing. And it's like, yeah, my intention, I'm never going to do this because I don't want to put other people in this position. But like my intention would be that you take your food and get the fuck out of here. All right. And then the next guy can pay like a normal person. Like that's, that's all we're trying to do. I do try to be like very conscious in like traffic, for example, of like, I'll let one person in. All right. You know, somebody's been waiting a while. I'm going to be the guy that's going to let you in, but not all of you, because what I hate is when you let one person through and like three people try to get into the gap and it's like, I will immediately pull forward. It's like, I let one person in. Yeah. That's the understanding. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. But it's just taking advantage. Yeah. So, you know, I, when I emailed you guys, I think I briefly mentioned this too. There's two types. I think of good deeds too. There's like the thing that Lilia and Helene are active with, which is 
something like volunteering at the soup kitchen, right? Like mm-hmm. helping to serve people and stuff like that. Or I was saying in the email, like cleaning up a local park, which comes into more like a premeditated charity. What I feel like is like the old lady I stumbled across in the parking lot. It's like some random act of kindness that just kind of happens, right? It just, it just kind of occurs. And then your reaction, I feel like the gen, you know, the Royal you is like a test almost. It's like, how am I going to, I have the wherewithal, I see it happening. I have the ability to help. Am I, what, you know, it's like almost like what kind of human being wouldn't help? It's almost like that. It's almost, it almost feels like it really does. It feels like a test almost. Yeah. There's also just like, like again, doing things that like, I feel like I'm capable of making people comfortable. So I was in line at Starbucks the other day and there was this dad with a very large, like double stroller. And it was kind of like more like a wagon because he had like twins in it. And he was like very apologetic every time he had to like move the thing forward. Like you could tell he just felt awkward being in this like very small coffee shop with this big wagon. And then like, and he was ahead of me. And at one point he pushes it forward and he looks back at me. He's like, I'm, I'm sorry. And I was like, that's a sweet wagon. You could go off roading with that thing. And like, he laughed, you know, and like he immediately, I could just tell he immediately was like, these people aren't annoyed by me, you know, because the whole time I'm in line behind this guy, he seems just like very awkward about having these two kids in a wagon and i'm just like don't worry about the fucking wagon guy like it's cool and so like making a little joke about it like suddenly the guy was like completely different you know he he wasn't apologizing to me every time he had to move type thing yeah and it so it just was like that's those are things i try to do when i'm out in public is if i can make somebody smile or you know, feel more at ease. I am constantly anxious, like everywhere I go. So like, if I see somebody else suffering, I'm like, well, you know, like I'll try and help. You know, I can't make myself feel better, but maybe I can make you feel better. That's so thoughtful. That that's. I remember being a young parent with little kids, and that is the attitude. Like you constantly feel apologetic in public. I remember the kids, like when they were fussing or throwing a tantrum when we were in a restaurant, I would be mortified. And it always meant the most to me when a, when a person or another couple were like, it's totally fine. Like, we're vocally like, don't worry. Like, we're cool. It, you know, versus the people that storm out. Like, can we get our shit to go? Like, we can't listen to this like, type of thing. So that, j- just being mindful of that when you're not even a parent is like, wow, that's, that's impressive. My guy. And also yeah, the other I, thing. I don't even like kids. I, I don't I don't like them very much, but I people take that the wrong way. And it's like, no, like I'm not a mean person and I'll never be mean to a child. and I'm never going to be the person who's like, oh, get this kid away from me. But it is of like, yeah, I don't even like kids. But if somebody's like on like there was one time I was flying by myself and there was this like really nice couple and they kept apologizing because their kid was fussy. And I was like, no, I was, and I said, I think I just said to the lady, you're doing a great job. And the woman seemed just like overjoyed but it it just is it's like no like i don't want to share a space with your kid but i'm not going to make a stink about it i'm not going to make it worse for you either it's like yeah you're doing something that sucks and sucks for all of us so it's like why make it worse you know it's just at the end of the day like i would rather make that person feel better than make them feel worse that's the kind of energy that's the kind of i remember dust i want to hear from you but this is a funny story when graden was little he was probably one and he was sitting in a high chair in a restaurant that we went to fairly frequently and he was eating his little cup of cheerios and throwing them you know just throwing them like i think it was behind him and he kept throwing he kept chucking them behind him eventually i turned around the cheerios were landing directly in this man's salad and the joining table and for god knows how long now graden was chucking cheerios for minutes so i don't know the guy i caught the guy patiently taking the Cheerios out of his salad and putting them aside and just eating his salad. He wasn't, he he was so polite that he wasn't even saying, can you please stop your child from throwing his cereal in my salad? (laughs) Which is like, I I, I just remember being floored by that. I remember actually having to be like, thank you. You know, like actually have to address it. Like, wow, you're being so cool. Like unnecessarily cool, you know, but that was the type we, when you're, when you're a first time parent, or a young parent and you're dealing with that for the first time, you just think you're the biggest burden on earth. 
anytime you're in public. So when people reacted that way, which were basically, you know, those were probably older parents that had been through it. So they remembered. So they were sympathetic. That's what I'm saying is so so special about you, Micah, because you haven't been in that situation yet. You know, to have that that level of empathy, it's pretty cool. And you got to be careful. You're right, because I thought of as soon as you said you got to be careful roadside with helping Joe Blow, right? Because that's where the murder victim went wrong in Silence of the Lambs. The dude was loading his couch into the back of the yep. van, right? Yep. Yeah, and he was, right he was going there. first. Yeah. <laughs> going first. I, I, think of, I think of that. I actually, it's the, I, it's so funny you bring that up because I think of that scene where I'm like, that's a brilliant way to get someone in a van, you know, and just kidnap them. That's like a totally brilliant way. I'm sure that that's given people plenty of ideas in the past. <laughs> It's so morbid, but yeah, that's that, that that part of the movie where it's like, please don't. How could you be so foolish? Oh my god, in that situation. It, so you know, what, dust or Kyle, how however you guys want to take it, good deeds. I mean, I just have to get this out of me. Dirty deeds, dirty, <laughs> dirty. Dirt. Okay, cool, Dustin, you can go now. Uh, sure. Dustin. So, dude, uh, talking about the doing a good deed to someone, uh, like helping them out when you can tell they're in a bind. That's one of my favorite things that probably uh, maybe one of the ways where I will or at least try to regularly. I think of an example where uh, the restaurant Holly and I always like to go to is called the chop shop. We were all there at, at the first sacred symbols or the first last stand event in Butler. We always have great service there. No problems. One time we went there and we got one of the waitresses we normally have and you could tell things are not going well. There's not that she was like crying, but I could tell she was flustered and the service was not good. Uh, and I could tell she was trying really hard and it necessarily wasn't her fault. In fact, I think I heard, we heard another table giving her shit for something. And, uh, you know, at the end of the, the meal, like she like apologized, gave us our check. She's like, I'm so sorry that this, you know, things have been crazy, but we're like, you know, it's don't worry about it. like, we get it. We've both worked in service and sometimes stuff like this happens. And so Holly and I, we were just like, yeah, we're, we're going to tip a little extra. And we wrote, Holly wrote like a nice little note, like, don't worry about it. Stuff like that, where if you can make somebody who is panicky or in a, a bad situation and, and maybe even you're part of the recipient of that uh, not going well, just be like, it's cool. Kind of like Michael was saying with the, the crying baby that happened to us on the way to Japan where we sat beside a woman with a baby, uh, did not speak English. She was Japanese. And Holly was like, it's good. And Holly was like playing with her baby and, and having a good time. And uh, uh, the baby was extremely annoying at a few points. But like, <laughs> we get it. What are we supposed to do? Like, like I said, like, let's let's just make this easy for everybody. I do have a situation where a good Samaritan helped me with a, a flat tire. Oh. I was filling up the air in my tire and the like the little nozzle just broke off just completely oh, no. broke off and i was like no so i quickly drove the car over to a different parking spot i've changed a tire before and put on the the spare but it's at that point it had been years and i'm like you Dagan, that not really a car guy at all and i know it's just changing a spare it's like i've done this but i gotta figure kind of refigure it out so i'm <laughs> open up the back i'm getting the tire out and this uh, very stereotypical, like kind of gruff Western PA dad comes over and he's like, you got flat. I was like, yeah, I think I might be good. And I think he could immediately tell from the sound of my voice. <laughs> I had no fucking clue what I was doing. And he's like, here, let me take a look. And immediately just takes over and completely changed my tire. He's got a cig in his mouth the whole time. <laughs> And then, he, you know, he's kind of like, 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 you know, doing the dad grunt and stuff, changes it out. I was like, dude, thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate it. That would have taken me probably half an hour and you did it in, in five minutes. And he's like, yep. And he starts walking away. And I was like, can I can I go in with you and get you a drink? He all I see is from behind. He just goes, but uh, for, he just like waved my hand away and then walked into sheets. And that was it. I was like, man, this dude needed no glory. He, and he sometimes, you know, I'm I am probably going to be resistant to someone's help because I don't want to put someone out for helping me. 
And he just immediately took over. Someone like him, he was the angel in this this uh, Pittsburgh as you know, dad with his sig. <laughs> totally saved me. So the one crazy instance I can think of of helping someone out, and I don't feel like this is a situation that anyone in this situation or afterwards like should be like, wow, you did a good thing. It's like, no, that was just what needed done. In college, I was at an event in Pittsburgh that was for the college youth ministry that I was part of, like this big event. And uh, of course, being at the, the Christian college ministry event, me and my friend at around midnight outside the Omnia Hotel were smoking Lucky Strikes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were smoking Lucky Strikes outside the Omni around midnight. And we see this dude at like kind of a weird half sprint coming up the street from the darkness and he's holding his head. It's like, oh, oh no, what the hell's going on here? And we see him as this car goes right. He runs up and he taps on the car window. He's like, hey, I need help. I've been I was stabbed. And the, the taxi driver, we can hear him. And he's like, no, no, no you'll, you'll get the blood in my car and then drives <laughs> away. So as this guy is coming to approach us, we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa sit down, dude, like sit down. We're going to, we're going to call the police. We're going to call the ambulance and we'll, we'll run into the hotel. See what we, we get like <laughs> some napkins or something, something to put pressure on. So this dude sat down, the police showed up. He was indeed stabbed in the head at some oh. nightclub. Uh, oh. I don't know what the situation was. The dude was definitely on something as well. But uh, that's one of those things where I don't think it was like some amazing good deed we did. I mean, it was just funny. It's like we saw this dude actively try to get help from this guy. And he was like, just worried about the blood uh, in his car and drove away. That it sucks. Was insane. So we always joke about the time how we like we were joking. About like, oh, yeah, remember we saved that guy's life when we were smoking cigs at the at the <laughs> Christian college event. Lucky strikes <laughs> like, like you're Don Draper. Oh, what yeah, you? dude. Those were back in the days when you could buy them unfiltered, too. Oh, oh man. It's toasted. That was the ad campaign, right? It's toasted. It's toasted. That That's what? right. This is Don Draper original. Right. That's right. Dude, I li that reminds me. I've always I don't know why I think of it being a doctor so much. I don't think I was ever smart enough to go to medical school, but I'm always so sympathetic towards doctors because that's part of their whole that's the Hippocratic oath, right? Like they have to be a doctor 24 hours a day even when they're off. So if that was a doctor instead of you, Dust, he would have had to help that guy. Like a doctor's yeah. never off. Right. Never off. Always has to be on. on Does anyone know a doctor? <laughs> Is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? Yeah. God, what could be what could be cooler than being a doctor? Seriously. That's the coolest job. Yeah, think, but cool think about like, think about Jack and Lost, like how annoying that must have been. No, exactly. Like, I, I think being a doctor is awesome. But if I'm thinking of cool jobs, I'm thinking of race car driver, dairy farmer, <laughs> dairy, you know, dairy farmer. guy who, you know, those cola guard boxes, you send your poop in the mail. I'm yeah. thinking about the guy who scans all those, you know, if I'm thinking of cool jobs, I'm, I'm not thinking about being a doctor. Dude, I could totally I, I say this every time I go into the dentist every six months, like I, when I talk to the technician that like, you know, just kind of scales your teeth and goes. Through. I'm like, I could see this being very satisfying. Mm, and they often yeah. and they often say that it is like I think I have the kind of mind in another world where I would have done something like that, where it's like, yeah, like it just, is on YouTube now. Yeah, is it really? Uh, when I and it's I did sure. not watch it to me, that would be gross because um, I thought about being a dental hygienist when I was younger. And then I was like, oh, that's gross. Um, but w Rush got his teeth cleaned recently. I watched just like an overview video on YouTube of like what to expect when your dog gets, goes to the dentist. But then I saw all these human dental cleaning videos. And it was like, woman hasn't been to the dentist in four years and they're going to scrape her teeth. And I'm Oof, like, oh, so this is gross. on here now. It's something we've yeah, talked gross. about. I was like, that would be satisfying. I think to I, think do, I could. I wanna, it is on there now. I want to see if I would watch those because I do watch Dr. Pimple Popper. I do enjoy that. Oh. That oh, doesn't you do bother watch me. That? That's mom's thing. Yeah, yeah, mom loves that too. And mom will it. watch it on TV and I keep telling her, I'm like, mom, it is a YouTube channel. It was a YouTube channel first and you can watch all of this without the go. commercials whenever you want. They don't understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. they just, it's like, it's just it's beyond their comprehension. All right, should, should I get in here as we wrap this topic up? I guess. Oh, I, have, uh, I have one last oh, thing I want to say. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Just where I was at the receiving end of a good deed. Mm, and I'm oh. gonna, I'll keep it somewhat <laughs> anonymous, but uh, when 
Holly and I first got married. Holly still had her her last year of college left. I was working part time. She was working part time. We maybe made a combined 20,000, 25. So we were doing just fine, uh, but money was tight <laughs> at points. And I know, Colin, you have a similar instance of this, of getting that first college bill. Yeah. Oh, my God. In the mail. Horrible. horrible. And seeing, uh, you know, that $500 a month and that immediate like drain, that panic of like, man, are we, we can do this. We just have to cut back. Uh, we have to change a lot of things to make this work. And uh, someone helped us out with that first year when we were like really worried about what was going to happen. And it was amazing and totally unexpected. And it, like I said, I think we could have made it work, but it would have been really, really tough. It would have made for a lot of anxiety. And uh, by the time that year was up, some things had changed. Holly was working more. I think I either got a raise or was working more and we were able to handle it at that point. But it was it truly was like a divine blessing at that moment. We it's not like we didn't ask anybody for it. It's just uh, it was offered to us and it was awesome. And I always think about that, uh, how like how much that would have really sucked. And so that kind of thing is awesome. And I will say the the last thing just to, to before I throw it over to you, Colin, is that I think the best act of kindness or best acts of kindness are anonymous. Uh, when you can do something for someone and it's uh, maybe they don't know or maybe they do know and you're like, I'm not I'm not doing this so you can go and, and tell people about it. I don't want you to tell. I'm just doing this because I want to do this for you. Um, I think that's awesome. That's always the type of things that, uh, you know, when you do hear about or, or if you're able to do it, whether it's just, uh, you know, paying for someone when they need something, something like that. And, and being on the receiving end, too. I've Holly and I have been out to eat. And because Holly's a voice teacher, she sees people that she knows everywhere. And it's like one time we went to pay and, and they said, oh, someone's someone paid for you. You're good. And they they didn't say who it's like, dude, that. That's awesome. You want to know because you want to thank them. But at the same time, it's it's a nice gesture to be. Well, yeah, it feels good also because like that means that she touched someone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean it like oh. that. Oh, but yeah, she's like touching that, all the kids. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> In their hearts. Right. Um, yeah, this is funny because. For some reason, I'm thinking about like, you know, that whole idea of like your love language and there's like the, all these different languages that you speak like. Uh, yes. And for me. I'm not deeply, I don't know that, like that whole thing very well, but for me, it, I'm not the guy, cause I don't have a car. I don't drive. Like, it's like, I can't give you a ride somewhere. I can't go pick you up at the airport. I can't, you know, do those kinds of things. So I do try to find ways as I've gotten older to, to do nice things for people in my life specifically. And I think about my friend, my old friend, Craig Baradon in San Francisco, who's still a buddy of mine. I mean, we talk every once in a while still, and he was a great guy. And I remember he he broke up with his girlfriend and kind of like urgently needed help to move. Like he rented like a big moving truck and I'm like, and helping people move sucks, but people have helped me. Right. So I'm like, okay. And I remember like sacrifice. And we have funny memories of this because we went, we went to like Safeway and just got food and we got just a pre-sliced thing of like honey ham or something. And we're just eating it out of the thing as we were like, that was like what we decided to buy for some reason. Animals. And and uh, I, so I, I, there's little things like that for friends, right? Like where you try to do the right thing. And then there are bigger things. And so we talk about the love language stuff where I can't do very much for you. I don't I don't have connections. I don't I don't like I said, I, I don't have transportation. I don't do you know, so like can't bring you to your doctor's appointment or anything like that. Um, but as I've gotten older and especially in my thirties when I got away from IGN is like, I've been very financially blessed and I try to do nice things for people with some of the money in terms of like, I've lent a very good friend a lot of money because they, they were in trouble, right? I paid for a close loved one's honeymoon. Um, you know, I've lent multiple people, money in a short-term way in order for them or given them money in order to 
to you know fulfill some sort of thing that they need because i realize that you hear the statistic that half of all americans don't have four hundred dollars and i read this i was listening to barry weiss yesterday and she was saying that now the new stats say like 60 percent of people consider themselves living paycheck to paycheck including people in six digit um you know frames of mind and 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 environments where they they're expected to spend lots of money but they're just they don't have it and i consider that I consider myself incredibly lucky that that is well, that's far away from reality. And I try to remember that that is not the case for a lot of people in my life. Certainly not a lot of people listening or in the world. And so I try to use that thing that gives me comfort and security to try to help a little bit in other ways. And I agree with you, Dustin, so I won't get any more specific is like a lot of it is like not it's like it, it's not important. You know, like I, the, the, it, it, I've done nice things and it's like, that's cool. I'm, I'm ha- in that regard. And it's like, OK, that, that, that doesn't need to be spoken about. Names don't need to be said. Amounts don't need to be said. It doesn't matter. And the other thing that I try to do, I guess, and I consider myself and I've said this before because I have this very people think I'm like a very gruff persona and like very whatever brash, but I'm actually, and I think everyone would agree because you all know me in person is like, I'm actually very friendly to people in, and especially when we're out and about and like, I try to be nice to people. I just think that if you just like getting into an Uber, I don't do that anymore, but it's like, I would always be like, Hey, how's it going? My name's Colin. Like when I get in, not something like the way I'd really act normally, but just to kind of set a good cadence where like we can have a friendly rapport. And so I try to just treat people like that generally and i think that what was funny uh, the one thing that i do like a good silent deed is i am we live in a nice neighborhood but people put their garbages out often overflowing and shit things get like flown you know off and then things will just sit in like common areas like a piece of garbage or whatever like in the woods and you can see it or whatever and i'm i pick up garbage in our neighborhood if it didn't if i didn't do it it would stay there forever straight up And so that's kind of like a nice little deed I do when I'm trying to pick things up. And recently in our neighborhood, another nice deed, I guess, is and this can we I like our neighbors. We live next to these people and our houses are all like your house. We have long yards, but thin yards. So the houses are somewhat close to each other so that the house next to us is only a few feet from our property. And then we have probably 25 or 20 feet and then it's our house and then we have we actually have no one on the other side really close to us. And uh, this person's water off their y- off their house is just coming all in our yard and like fl- like fucking up our plants on the like on the side of our yard and all this kind of stuff. And I I talked to him and I was so it, in terms of like principle this is for him to fix. Like it's dumping water into my yard from your house you need to figure this out. If I wanted to be right. a dickhead I could say like, you need to pay for this. You need to figure this out. I don't want to make problems, but this is something you need to figure out. Look at my, like, I need to get this sorted so that we can get, you know, plants going on this side that are not getting like washed away and shit. And instead, because I was like, I thought about, we, we might live together next to each other forever. Right. Um, like it might, it might be that we just both never leave. And we have, you know, we don't, we don't haven't spoken deeply or anything like that, but we're, we're nice to each other and stuff. So I'm like, I approached him and I was like, listen, would you want to go halves on, on fixing this problem, which he was amenable to. And it's like a $6,000 problem because you have to dig the trench all the way through the backyard. We, again, we live in these long yards. So like you have to dig it all, all the way back to the gutter. And instead of going to him and being like, I kind of expect that you, this is your yard and it's kind of affecting me. So this is kind of like on you. I approached him with that and then he came back to me and he was like, he's like, can we talk about this in a few months? Because we kind of have, they have a new kid and stuff. And we're like, we have some childcare payments to make and all these kinds of things. And I'm like, listen, I'll pay for all of it. If you pay for 2000 and I'll, I'll I'll front it and you pay me whenever you can. And that's what we're going to do. And I feel like that's, maybe using a little bit of what I was saying earlier, where I probably am more financially fluid than him. And so maybe that's the way I can be nice to my neighbor, but also kind of trying to nurture that relationship so that we don't have bad relations. Like 
in fact, I feel like I, I did an, a, a, an overt kindness in some way that will make the relationship better in some in some sense and and you know nurture it. So I think it, this is very Randian, and it's not the way I really feel. But it's like I and Rand would argue that you do kind deeds either for the accolades or to, for the for the return, right? But it is, and I don't really believe in that. I I literally just try to do nice things because it's cool to kind of just put that into the ether. Right. And I can, in that case, afford to do that and it will help get this problem done and it approaches a neighbor in a very nice way. And then maybe the shoe will be on the other foot one day. And then it's primed for that eventuality, but that will probably never happen. And in the meantime, it was just a nice thing to do. You know, Um, you're not doing it for the cred or the glory or any kind of reward, but you bank the favor. Right. It's like the same thing I said. I don't like Christmas presents. I've said this before. I think it's stupid for adults to give each other Christmas presents unless you are like a couple. And I think that that's fun. And I, so I totally endorse that. And so we've kind of done and here in the Virginia Moriarty family. We've done we used to do some gifts exchanges and I've really put the kibosh on that. And now we like just sponsor families to, you know, underprivileged families to like buy their what they need for the gifts or whatever, because it's like. Which is unthinkable when you think about it when you're younger. It's like, dude, I'll, I'll take all the presents you could possibly give me. You get to you do get to a point in your life. At least I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, I'm good. I don't. So so let's try to do on to others, I guess, in some sense. So it, it good deeds, man. Dirty deeds. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> when I first <laughs> heard that song when I was a kid, I remember it. going on to the Internet on dial up. I heard it in like the mid 90s. And I'm like, I thought he was saying like something and the Thunder Chief. And I, remember, I and, I, and I remember looking it up being like Thunder Chief lyrics like who what is this and I'm like oh and that was like my introduction to ACDC I didn't even really know anything about that's that. right that's ACDC mm-hmm. yeah and the Thunder Chief that's what I thought it was saying like <laughs> da 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 and the Thunder Chief but that's not what they're saying you reminded me my favorite misheard lyric that I had was that song leave me breathless but when I was a kid I thought it was leave me breakfast and I was all about it. And I'd be singing along like, leave me breakfast. I loved that song. And I was always like, it didn't make a lot of sense because they're like, tempt me, tease me, whatever. But I'm like, yeah, leave me breakfast. And I was like all about it. And it wasn't until like years later that, that I was Shania like, Twain? not saying that. No, no. I, I don't. I think it's a it's a group of women, right? Oh. I can't remember who sings that. Is that the rope? That's uh, the chorus. Yeah, oh, the there it is. That's the song, right? Leave me breathless. Go right, like that. On, go yeah. on. Yeah, go on. Go on. Yeah, yeah. I thought, yeah, the, I thought that was like, I, for some reason, I thought that was like a Shania Twain, like, turn the pop kind oh, of Oh, I yeah. mean, it definitely, yeah. it, it fits her vibe. But yeah, yeah, I always thought it was leave me breakfast. That and sounds I like a weird song owl. better. Like parody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, yeah, leave yeah. me breakfast. It really does. <laughs> That's a good topic, by the way, Mike. You might want to bank that one. Yeah. On her Misheard lyrics. lyrics. Misheard lyrics. Yeah. That yeah. would be a fun one. Yeah, I yeah. have several on account of my ears aren't too good. <laughs> All right, Dig, are you satisfied? Yeah. Well done, everybody. All right, excellent. We have two food things now. Yeah. A little, a little yin and yang. Dustin, let's begin with you. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest. When I was trying to think of a topic, I was bouncing between two, and I... I feel a little self-conscious about this topic uh, because it's talking about our body image to some degree. And my topic is eating healthy. I talked about this a little bit on sacred. So people already know, but uh, I'm on like hardcore trying to lose weight mode in 2024. And I've gone through phases of my life where I've been up and down and I can always feel it when it's time. It's like, oh, clothes aren't fitting right. And I got to I got to take it easy for a bit. So. I've been trying to figure out, like, what does eating healthy look like for me? And it's tough because uh, I guess to put it very bluntly, I hate eating healthy. I hate (laughs) Colin. and I have talked about this. I like eating like it's my last day alive every day. It's a miracle (laughs) by God that I'm not obese. Because I easily could be if I, uh, you know, didn't have any self-control, which often I feel like I don't. So with this current phase of eating healthy, I've been eating 1500 calories a day, uh, which is like on the like when I when I do the calculator for like my weight and my height and stuff, that's the 
a little lower than what's considered normal weight loss. And like a little lower than that would be extreme weight loss, which isn't necessarily healthy for all people. But so I've been figuring out, you know, what that looks like. And it's been pretty good so far. I let's see, it's the 12th. I have lost seven pounds. Wow. Wow, That's that's awesome. That's huge. Which to be fair, the first five are like water weight. Uh, which those those leave like that when you start not eating like it's the last year you're alive. Uh, but it's been it's been better than I thought it would be in that uh, what I'm doing right now, like I said, is just calorie counting. I've tried different things like eating, like doing keto and stuff like that. And keto did work for me and it works for a lot of people in that I'm pretty sure that If you're eating keto, you practically can eat as much as you want, as long as it's the things that you are within the diet, like the, you know, like meats and cheese and stuff, leaving out carbs and bread and stuff like that. And while there is some liberating aspect to think, oh, I can eat as much as I want. When you realize it's like, well, no, these these things you really like. They are out uh, forever. So, I mean, not, I guess, as long as you're on the diet, which I think like keto, once you go off it, it's like ooh, a lot of you can gain it back really, really fast. But I guess this doesn't even necessarily need to apply to weight loss either. Just in general of like. Eating healthy for, uh, you know, getting the right nutrients or just trying to eat healthy so you don't feel like shit all the time like that's another aspect too that i've been i've been the person that's like man why don't i feel like crap all the time it's like well have you considered that you haven't eaten any kind of vegetable in two weeks (laughs) that might be part of it uh and it's frustrating too and i I mentioned this a little earlier that and this has come up on the show that i am a somewhat picky eater maybe not even somewhat i am a picky eater not as bad as a Holly and I have been watching on YouTube the strange eaters that was on some. Oh, yeah, TV freaky show. eaters. Picky is it picky eaters or strange eaters? I think it was freaky eaters. Freaky eaters. eaters. That's a great yeah. name. I love that show, dude. Uh, that's a rabbit, Colin. I think you might be interested in this. There's a guy, amazing, uh, that was like only eating pizza, and a guy yeah. that only ate French fries every yeah. day for 13 years or something. It's weird because sometimes these people can look healthy in that they're not overweight and they seem fine. But what's the best part is the host, like they do a blood test and they're like, the doctor has never seen a level this high in terms of your cholesterol or something like that. (laughs) You will have a heart attack. It is a matter of when, right? So that's something I'm trying to keep in mind too. Um, but Dagan, I was I was curious because I know you've talked about this a little bit. And yeah. as long as I have known you, you have been super slim and healthy. And I know that that was a part of your life where you like made a change. So I'm really curious about what that was like for you and what was like what triggered the change. And then like how hard was it to realize like the thing for me right now, it's I'm 30 now and I'm not old, but I'm not 20 anymore. And so these things start to really pile on you. And for me, it's almost like a pivot point where I can keep eating like I have for my entire twenties, or I can make the change now before things get bad. Right. You're I mean, that's smart. I think you're, I think you're starting on time for sure. If not early, at least compared to me dust. I mean, you know what I figured, you know what I, I should say, you know what I realized that I was taking eating healthy seriously when I started ordering the kale salad from Chick Fil A, oh, I hate. Did kale. you even know they had kale salad at Chick Fil A? No, I didn't find out until like three years. I ago. I love kale. It's so it's so good, but you know what my my whole trajectory with eating dust was very similar to what you're saying. Like my entire twenties and thirties into my forties was completely hedonistic, undisciplined eating whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Right. And I was blessed, probably similar to you in that I always had a fast metabolism, although people are always shocked to hear this. Like I was up to like nearly 200 pounds. Now I'm a guy, I'm 5'10 on record. I lost an inch somewhere. I'm like 5'9". So 200 pounds, I was, I was pretty heavy. 
And it wasn't, even though my metabolism probably was keeping pace, the the food, like my eating habits were just completely unchecked. Like I just ate whatever I want. And it wasn't only because it, was, it wasn't only becoming like, a fatty, it was like a question of like your cholesterol, my heart, like I'm getting older, all that kind of thing. And then crossing over to my blood sugar was like, all right, you have to check the carbs. You have to, you know, start monitoring your food intake at some point. It's like, it's like time to grow up. And I think if I look, if I chart my history with food dating back to like being a kid, I think my parents were a blessing and a curse because they were always, my mom was Italian, right? She, she cooked delicious food. She's a very talented cook. I grew up also with my grandmother, my great grandmother's Italian cooking. So flavorful, delicious food was never a problem. But my parents, Kyle and I have talked about this from time to time. Our parents were huge proponents and advocates of like fresh vegetables and had like a huge, tremendous vegetable victory garden in their backyard. Not only were they health nuts about, not so much health nuts, but they were just, even in the 70s and 80s, were very much pro-vegetable and not only eating vegetables, but growing their own. My parents grew anything and everything you could think of. It was like that fenced in, beautifully manicured vegetable garden was like a quarter of a big backyard. It was like a huge garden. And so I grew up loving rich food, delicious food. We didn't eat out a lot. Fast food was like a treat. You know, it was few and far between and a lot of fresh vegetables. So I never minded eating healthy because I grew up that way and eating the vegetables and zucchini and my my dad grew even weird shit that my friends still make fun of like Swiss chard and kale and all these leafy (laughs) greens. You know, it's like really some hippie shit. I think PJ calls but, your dad or calls dad Swiss chard, doesn't he? Swiss like, chard. Yeah. You know, like the Swiss <laughs> chard thing was like, what the hell is Swiss chard? Now it's like at full Whole Foods. But my parents were, they were pretty cutting edge with that stuff back then. People weren't growing Swiss chard in their backyard. They really enjoyed it. And so I was like any other kid. I wanted to eat the burgers and the chicken nuggets and go to McDonald's all the time. But we, I really didn't go that often. Until I got much older in my teens and I would always say to myself, when I'm older and I'm out of my own and I have my own income, I'm going to just eat whatever I want. Like if I want Mexican, if I want ribs, if I want to go out for fast food, if I want to eat Wendy's six nights in a row, Chinese, whatever. And I did that once I got into my 20s. And once I had my own income, I could do whatever the hell I wanted. And I think a lot of that was kind of a kickback at how I grew up and how it was like, you weren't going to have that stuff. You were going to have that stuff for a treat. And that was it. So it was me sort of sowing my wild oats. But the, the upside of it was I did, it wasn't because I didn't like the healthy food. It was just, I wanted more. I wanted the, the tasty stuff. So when I got old enough to realize, you know, which wasn't honestly till my early to mid forties where it was like, all right, it's time to slow your roll. You have to really kind of be mindful of what you're eating now. Then I could fall back on, well, I like zucchini. I like kale. I like all that stuff. I don't mind it. So because what my parents planted early on in me, no pun, right? It was easy to make that transition to because I already knew that world. I come from that world. What I got, what I get concerned about is my son is much like me. He likes to eat all the good food all the delicious food, but he, he'll eat anything and he'll try anything and he makes himself fruit salads and stuff. My daughter, she'll be 17 in March and just like complete carbs, rich food, hates vegetables, fruit skeeves are out. Dude, she, dude, a fucking wind could pull her away though. I mean, that's the whole thing, <laughs> right? Like she's so she, yeah, she skinny. dances five days a week. She's a ballerina. I mean, she's, she's built like a dancer, you know what I mean? Like, but that's where I'm like, Lil, you need, because of your the physical demands you're putting on your body, it's like you could do this now that you're 16 going on 17, but this is going to hit you at some point. Like you need the vitamins, you need the nutrients, you need nutritious foods in your diet as well. She has to take basically like fruit and vegetable supplements because produce skeeves are out. Like it's so, it's like, where did you come from? Like you couldn't have fell any far from the grandpa tree 
It's like our dad that could be a vegetable drop of a hat. That's the other thing too that helps me out. Like Helene is not a vegetarian, but Helene could be a vegetarian at any given moment. All she really enjoys on the, you know, on the, on the protein side of things is salmon and chicken. Other than that, she could, she could honestly dispose of that at any given time. And she read, I don't know if this would help you, Dustin. I went through a phase in my thirties where I was getting big and I knew it was unhealthy. You know what it was? I remember what it was. I needed to get life insurance and Mm. they came out we were living in our first house at the time. They came out to give me the physical to get my MetLife life insurance plan because we were having kids and I was just trying to be responsible. And I think my triglycerides or my cholesterol was high at that point. And then I had realized, okay, you know, you're getting older. Your habits are catching up with you. What can you, what can you do to remedy this? And I tried to scare myself straight. I remember watching the Morgan Spurlock Super Size Me movie. We saw it and it went out and saw it in the theater, a little indie art movie theater house. And then I picked up that Eric Slosher book, Fast Food Nation, which was like sort of an expose on, you know, how bad fast food is. That's a great book. Great, great book. It's it's like the modern day the jungle, the Upton Sinclair. Totally. Sort of yeah. It's funny because right, m- remember the whole thing would be like, uh, you'll never eat fast food again after you read this. And I read it and I'm like, well, I'm still eating fast food, but Dude, it, was, it was certainly, was it was certainly an interesting <laughs> read. Yeah. I was back eating fast food like three days after I saw super, super size me. It didn't scare me at all. You know, it was like, there was, there was this, so that tactic didn't work for me, but Helene stumbled across a book and also a Netflix, a separate Netflix series that I think is airing right now. One is sort of, it, it's kind of like a, um, it's sort of an expose on chicken, you know, farming cattle and chicken specifically in this country and how bad it is. And then the book, I think Neil, I heard it on Neil Brennan's podcast. He's a vegetarian. And I think he got this advice from Ellen DeGeneres and that's why she became a vegetarian. But it's basically a thing about how bad meat is for you. And it wasn't, it's not that meat is physically bad for you. It's just the practices of, it's the meat packing slash raising of these animals and all that kind of stuff. That's just, it's not good. Like it's toxic and it's unhealthy and it's disgusting and it's, it's dirty and all that kind of thing. So that, but that kind of stuff didn't work for me. But what helps me is that Helene, Helene is really on the verge of becoming vegetarian, I feel like. And she cooks that way now. So she'll make like, she made a dish the other night that was delicious. I don't know if you could do this thus because you're a picky eater, but she made basically sesame chicken Mm -hmm. like you would order from a Chinese restaurant. But she just subbed in cauliflower for the chicken and it was roasted cauliflower and it was, it was delicious, dude, just served over rice. So the only thing you're really changing out, you still got the sauce, you still got the scallions and the sesame seeds and all that. You're just changing out the cauliflower for chicken in that case. Yeah. And if, as long as you like cauliflower, it was so good, you know? And even that's the other thing to reward yourself. Like give yourself a milestone. Don't be all or nothing, you know? Like say, mm-hmm. okay, if I get through the week, maybe I could have a five guys night on a Saturday or two Saturdays a month or something. You know, don't make it all or nothing because I think you still, I think it's all about balance. You know, right. my doctor says that and I think that's definitely true. One thing in the this process which is this happens to me every few years when i do try to lose some pounds is that it's uh you know it's the gi joe thing knowing is half the battle (laughs) of how much uh some things are in calories i the other night i was telling holly i was like man i know i'm only what how many days into this uh, 11 days into this i'm like i want pizza so (laughs) bad and here's the thing i could eat pizza absolutely as long as it's within the if I have the calories for it for the day, that's why I like counting calories is that you can still eat pizza or whatever. It's just account for it. Maybe eat something light for lunch, go easy. Right. But I figured out as, as the audience knows, I love Papa John's. I was like, man, uh, each slice, I think for a pepperoni and cheese, Papa John's is like 300, 350 ish. And it's like, dude, I was putting down four, uh, and that's oh, easy, and they, easy. Yeah, easy. 
And then <laughs> I would always get the deal that you got some kind of side thing, whether it's like breadsticks or oh, they've yeah. got that stupid papadilla thing that I've gotten a few times. It's not that great. But anyway, so then you, you have some of that too. And then, you know, maybe after you eat, after a little bit later, you have a little ice cream snack or something. And I'm like, holy fuck. Uh, I was eating more than the daily allotment that I'm giving myself uh, by a long shot in just between like dinner and a little treat afterwards. And, you know, it's kind of sad because I like going hard and eating five pieces of pizza uh, <laughs> as often as possible. I was joking that one of those videos is a guy that's like, he's eaten nothing but pizza for 15 years. I'm like, God, yeah. I wish that was me. Yeah, please, <laughs> please. I wish that could be me. But it could be. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Well, you're I had to you. run it into the ground. That's what I was saying with the Chick-fil-A with the cow salad. Like on those nights where I could see, you know, it gets to be like six o'clock. It's like, I'm not planning on cooking anything. Helene's not planning on cooking anything. The girls are out shopping or something. I know I'm going to get the phone call of we're picking up Chick-fil-A or we're picking up Memphis barbecue. What do you want? And I ran fast food into the ground so hard that I can't even eat another Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. That's Whoa. bad that I had to get to that point where it's like, I'm so tired of it yeah. because I just did it, you know, mercilessly for so many years that I can't even think about like that. That's bad. But I, you know, you have 12 years on me probably from when you're getting started and sort of trying to go straight. So you're, you're going to get to that point much quicker than I did, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that that book. I haven't read this book, but I know there's a website. It's like Eat This, Not That. Yeah, and it's all about that might be the book. Okay, yeah, dude, some of that stuff is awesome. Like I've I figured out one of the places that I have eaten in the last two weeks is uh, surprisingly Chipotle. Uh, mm -hmm. If you make the right decisions there, it can be like five six hundred calories for Chipotle. It's one of those things when you know, it's like, oh, that tortilla, the tortilla in your burrito is 320 calories, which uh, is when you think about the context of the whole burrito, that's a lot. Like you that's save a lot, lot by just getting the bolt. And don't get me wrong. I love the tortilla on a burrito. It's one of the oh, best. It's the best. It's the best part. So I mean, it's, that's the thing. It's like, I wouldn't even bother at that point. It's the carbs. Yeah, dude. I, OK, I always I always made fun of people for getting the burrito bowl. Uh, I still will. I'll make fun of myself. But yeah, I've been I've been doing the bowls and they've been awesome. But the one thing I guess this is where I can throw this over to, to you, Colin, is that I need to add in exercise uh, and I hate exercising. Also, I hate healthy food. I hate exercising and it makes me mad at myself because I hear people and, and Colin, you, you've you talked about this where it's like you got to exercise. You don't feel right until you exercise. And you mm. feel good afterwards. Definitely. I have never felt good after exercising. Ever. Yeah, you got to get you got to get over the hump. It's because you're at, you're not athlete, you're not in an athletic hey. shape. You're not in shape. You know, like it it you can get to that point. Even when I okay, the most consistent I've ever worked out would have been like when I was in summer gym, which was like three straight straight weeks every day from eight to noon. You know, you go to school in the summer, you get your gym credit out of the way, and I always hated it. I always hated every second of it. maybe because it was a school environment and I wasn't doing it for me. Maybe that was part of it. But anyway, Colin, I know you uh, have a very unique diet situation and stuff like that. So, yeah, I've talked about that want. endlessly. I don't want to bore people with that. I guess what I would say is, you know, I feel I, I'm getting uh, I have Micah checking me. So she says I'm, I'm in the clear right now, which is good. But I feel like I'm getting heavier again. And I always have like a, a little bit of a gut, sometimes a little bit more of a gut than not. That seems disproportionate to the rest of my body in some way, because like it, for some reason, the food just doesn't spread around. And I think working out does help facilitate some of that. But the thing I'm trying to so I found I personally don't even know how much I weigh right now. I have no idea. I probably weigh probably around 200 pounds or something. But it's hard for me to know what is what in the sense that I have gotten way more muscular in the last two years or so than I was. Now I'm not like a fucking cut up gym bro. Let's but see the guns. But compared to compare. Okay. Compared to. Let's see. Oh, com compared to you know, where I was, I am. I mean, I was like a string bean. I was, I was actually looking at a picture or a video. Someone sent me a video of me playing guitar from 
I don't know, my IGN days. And like my arms are basically like straight, like, you know, like just there's just no definition at yeah, all. Like mine. So like, like mine. compared to where I was is I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a better I'm in a better space than I was. You can't really you got coming through here, but it's like, you know, yeah, you got a lot bigger, dude. Like and so I'm proud of that. And what, that's why I want to tell you, Dustin, was I'm not really a huge. I used to tell stories when I was on my, my hockey teams and we would work out and stuff. Goalies were always split off to do whatever they wanted. I would be like, I'm not doing fucking dick. <laughs> yeah. Like people are like lifting weights and running and stuff. And I'm like, I'm good. You know, I'm not. I'm sure I'm spry and small. And that's like what you what kind of want me to be. And I never really enjoyed it either. I was naturally I've said this before that I think I even underrate my natural athleticism. Like, I think I'm a naturally athletic person. I take the sports. I know how to play them. You know, you could put me in like a, not that I would play at a very high level, but like a baseball game, a basketball game, a hockey game, certainly, and all these different things. And I can play. And so I take, I, I think that that's kind of a natural maybe way to look at it is to try to find the things that you might be more naturally inclined to. And the weightlifting thing was useful for me in the sense that I actually did, you can see the difference. Like after a while, it's like, actually you are more buff than you have ever been. And I lift weights probably five to six times a week at this point. And I don't really go crazy with it. I mean, I could be way more jacked based on what I'm doing. I'm trying to just be healthy. I also right. find that lifting weights stretches my back out in a major way. The first time I lifted weights seriously and like really tried to do my regimen, my back felt so loose. I was like, oh man, like I can't even and you really feel it if you just lift up, like imagine holding something and like your back kind of coming to it just feels so good. It flattens your shoulders. It's, I can just feel it right now. And so I, I kind of like the way that feels. I do cardio virtually every day, either for a half an hour or an hour. And I'll weight lift most of the time. So cardio, I'll go like 28 or 29 out of 30 days. And usually when I don't go, it's because I'm just like, there's no time, which is rare. And yeah. that's where the weight loss comes in. And I feel, well, not weight loss, but the weight calibration. See, the saying goes that you cannot outrun your diet. And it's typically true. Like Lilia Dagan's daughter is like a unique example, kind of like I was in hockey where I would literally eat Lipton butter noodles, like an entire thing of Lipton butter noodles. That's like thousands of calories. <laughs> That's hard. And I would eat that and go to play hockey and I would not gain any weight or whatever, but I'm not like that anymore. I just don't burn calories like that. So I'm lifting my weights. I'm, I'm doing my cardio on, I do elliptical. I do high impact training on elliptical. So that means like high impact interval training. So one minute normal, one minute hard, one minute normal, one minute backwards, one minute normal, one minute hard, one minute normal, one minute backwards. And it just keeps your body kind of, it's supposed to be good for like tricking your body and using it as opposed to it getting used to it. Because if you just run for an hour, your body actually starts to meet like some sort of equilibrium in some way, especially if you have good wind and all that. And I can theoretically run on the elliptical for like a long time. I have great wind. And I do that also because I smoke weed and I just feel like I should. A doctor once told me, she's like, you working out is a liter is really irrelevant. It's, she's actually, she's like, it's for your lung health. She's like, it's great for your heart, but your, your lung health, it's not really a relevant thing. But I'm like, okay, I, I feel like I do it for that reason anyway. And then I don't want to be, when I thought I had celiac disease and I've told that story in the past uh, and I don't want to get too into it. It was like, uh, I, I have lifelong stomach problems. They thought that that's what they diagnosed. I had a false positive blood test and I didn't know for a long time. So I was working under the operation that I needed to cut gluten. And at that point, I kind of put myself, I never could stick to it. And as I said before, when I found out that it was a false positive was when I was the furthest into an unfettered, like I haven't had gluten in weeks situation. And I was like, you have, and then I immediately went and had a cheeseburger that night. Mm. And I was like, fuck this. This is awesome. I don't have to do this anymore. And it was the first time that I tried to say, like, you can't eat these certain things. And I just don't feel like that works for me. I, I know that that's crazy and that's kind of the way you have to do. But for me, it's about portion control. And I have a problem with that. I am hungry when I finally eat because I have not eaten in about 20 hours by the time I eat dinner. And Micah cooks really great dinners where I'll really go in like on those dinners and then and that will be my only meal really but then i'll usually have like something else afterwards like a couple of donuts or something like that or a bunch of cashews and pretzels and whatever and the calorie count is probably pretty high i think mitigated somewhat by my athletics every day i mean it just has to work out that way i also try to go walk around the neighborhood walk the dogs and just try to remain somewhat active in that sense 
but I'm probably teetering a little bit above my caloric intake where it would all meet and meet that equilibrium. There's no doubt about it. And I totally understand what you mean when you feel like it's like, uh, I remember I used to wear 32 inch waist pants and that's just never going to happen again there. I, I did like go up to like a 34 and that's kind of where I am. And it's like, eh. you know, now I'm like, and there I'm like, I don't want to go any higher than that. And that's a good calibration. I guess in some sense, although I don't wear my pants on my waist. So, I mean, it would be a much bigger if I like wore my pants like an old man where I like had my shirt tucked in and all this. So I, I, ju- I just think for me, the uh, one meal a day trying to d- I'm not I guess what I'm saying is I'm not going to make concessions on what I eat. Like I can't mm. do that. I don't want to do that. And I know it sounds dark and weird, but food is one of the only things I really enjoy. Like I don't get it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go look at the I'm going to be a fucking ornithologist and go look at the birds and walk around. It's like, no, I don't get joy out of all these things. I like eating food. The only thing right. I can do is say, like, I'm just not going to eat all day. And then when it comes time, just eat whatever you want. And I I think that the, it's true that you can only do so much damage to yourself in that in that framework. Like if you literally do not eat for 20 hours or so a day, which is what I do, you can only do so much to yourself in four hours. But I do I do pretty devastating damage sometimes in four hours. <laughs> and yeah. so I'm totally with you and I know what you're talking about and I know what you mean. But for me, the best balance is. It's it's funny. I think of the old Jets coach Rex Ryan, who lost a lot of weight when he was on the Jets, and they asked him how he did it, and he's like, "I just have one slice of pizza instead of the entire box," you know. Mm. And and it's like, yeah, totally. I that's kind of what my mentality is too. Like, I I'm not going to stop with the chicken cutlets. I'm not going to stop with the bread. Micah makes this bread. She makes her homemade bread. She makes the homemade rolls. She makes blueberry mu- fresh blueberry muffins and all these things. I'm like, dude, I'm eating this shit. But the one thing I'm grateful for, and this is, I don't know if I just did this to myself because I don't really remember how I felt when I was a kid. I was never really a breakfast person, but I am truly not hungry right now. And at this point, it's been, I don't know, 18 hours since I've eaten or something like that. You know, 17 hours. So like, I'm kind of blessed in that way where I'm not, I'm like, I got to fucking eat. I'm, oh, I see. I, I, I'm really not hungry. But by the by the night and, and so I, I, that's a long winded way of saying what I, what I needed to say, but yeah. it, it seems to work for me. I just but I am getting a little bit of a gut, no doubt. I think I kind of just have to accept that. I'm not going to be this like the more svelte person I once was like I was really skinny. I had a six pack. I had a fucking six pack and I didn't work out at all, you know, and that's done. And I, I just I just don't want to be obese. Sure. That's that's fine. Like that's and I think I think that that's doable because I think weight weight is a choice. And I really hate how in society we've made it into something else, but it's not. To a certain there are there were no morbidly obese people in the Middle Ages. Cuz like they couldn't even have possibly eaten all the processed food that we have available. Remember Mike, didn't we talk about the Fat Man's Club or whatever? in new york city oh, where you had a, yeah there was like these old pictures of this like fat man's club in new york oh, city yeah, you were. and they were, but the guys are like my literally like no bigger than probably me you, and you Dustin. had to be 200 pounds yeah i think to join and and, and it was hysterical like so these it's guys a really aren't that fat it's a choice and i think that like being slovenly in some way and like getting really really fat and like you, you why would you do that to yourself that's the thing that i want to check and i've said that in the past that it was an ex-girlfriend of mine who took a picture of me in my underwear when I was cooking one day and, I, and she showed it to me. I'm like, oh, my God. I am so I'm getting heavy scared and it fucking straight. scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And now that I'm on video all the time, I can kind of monitor myself in that way. But well, I just don't want to be I just don't want to get to that point. And so I have to check myself many, many orders of magnitude before that. That's all I'll say. Do bringing up uh like seeing yourself and that's that's the thing that's always that i've just have to accept is that i or at least try not to view myself as a vain person always thinking about what i look like to other people right when when either holly or something's like does this make me look bad does this i'm like shut up you know you look you look fine you look great and so but the reality is i'm the exact same way because legitimately and this is a little embarrassing to say but it's whatever i'm amongst friends i know the, the listeners like me a huge driver of me losing weight is that i want to look presentable for our next live show because 
there are certain times that I've seen photos of myself where I'm like, I'm going to be photographed a lot or whatever. Like I saw a photo of me at Christmas that someone took and I was like, ugh. You know, I'm sure it was the same experience, Colin, that you felt seeing the photo of you in your underwear. Totally. It's like, I, I also saw you have that moment where you're like, oh, that's what I look like. No. You know what I mean? I, I saw a, a, totally. And I, I saw a comment saying like, Colin, like look at Colin's gut or something at what the live show, which is like where I'm like, well, I'm definitely wearing a sweatshirt or something the next time. I mean, that, 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 that will definitely stick with me in that sense. You won't see my body again until I feel safe. <laughs> Yeah, Mike. We have yeah, when you're under the microscope. It's yeah. It's uh, that's uh, definitely an incentive. I would say. You know what the other thing is though, Dusta. I would say I think Colin does feel this way about his workouts. You know, I walk. I walk four miles a day, and Whoa. it's as much physical for me as it is psychological and emotionally rewarding. Like I need it for my peace of mind. I find just to get away from the screens, get away from the computer, clear my head. And I get my best ideas also when I'm walking. I think about what, I, what I'm going to say, how my approach to the podcast. I think about, you know, work with illustrations, how I'm going to handle an, an, you know, an animation, how I'm going to handle this scene. Like it's a big problem solving thing for me. Like I get, it has a great energy for me that goes beyond the physical. So you might, you just got to find that thing. It might not be walking, you know, it might yeah. be something else, but yeah. But yeah, Micah, we, uh, we haven't heard from you at all. I don't know. How, how are you feeling about this? Oh, yeah. Well, first, I definitely want to echo what Dagan's saying, Dustin, of like, I have always hated exercise. I'm lucky that I don't, I'm not saying, like, I, I don't have to exercise. I just, like, it, I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but it's like, I really don't change whether I exercise or not. But I do it purely for the mental health. But I had to find something I liked. And that really was the ticket, Dustin, of like, for me, it's I have my indoor bike. But it only works if I do the programmed bike workouts. If I just mm. sit down and like put on the TV, I get bored even with the TV on. But when mm. you put on a YouTube video and they tell you like increase resistance, decrease resistance, stand up for a minute, sit back down, that keeps me engaged in it. But if I just sit down and start pedaling, it's, it's fucking boring. It's horrible. But I had to find the thing I actually liked. I also started doing like uh, Pilates and like bar classes at home. And those are genuinely fun. And I like, I always hated exercise, but it truly was just finding something I liked, you know, like for Colin, he likes the elliptical. It just was of like, you have to just find something you actually enjoy. And there, there is something out there. Maybe you and Holly could get into pickleball. All right. Oh. All the young kids are playing <laughs> pickleball. That's what everybody's doing these days. And like, it's big, yeah, it really is though. Like there is going to be something you enjoy doing. You just have to find it. And maybe it's just changing it. If you have an exercise bike, maybe it is just finding like there's tons of free trainers on YouTube that just post videos. And it's like maybe it's just finding someone you like watching that makes it fun. Because there's a ton of them that are like just genuinely they're bubbly, they're energetic. It makes the class just fun. It's also my time to listen to podcasts generally without feeling guilty about it. I don't mean guilty in the way of like, Oh, I shouldn't be listening to that, but just like, oh, it doesn't feel like a waste of time. It doesn't feel like a sure. waste of time to watch Game Grumps for a half hour if I'm pedaling on my bike, for example. So that has been the ticket for me is just making it just making it enjoyable cuz I do hate exercise and I only do it for the mental benefit because the physical benefit there really is none. I just look the fucking same. But like when it comes to eating healthy, this the other thing is like for me, it's just all about moderation of like really just trying to tell yourself like, yeah, I let myself have like usually like one sweet per day, whether that's having some Oreos after dinner or having like, you know, Publix has the single serve slice of cake, which I buy oh. that just because Colin doesn't eat cake. Right. So I'll buy something like that maybe once a week as a special treat. And it's like, but I just that that's the limit. Right. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to have more than one sweet per day because i definitely can't do the one meal a day like colin does it's just like fucking crazy to me I, i'm already hungry like I, I ate at noon and i'm getting like i'm getting to the point now where like i'm gonna die if i don't eat something soon <laughs> but it's part of why i do cook so much at home is because the reality is that like we could get takeout every night of the week 
But I know it's healthier for both of us if we just don't do that. So it's why I do try and put in a lot of effort just in cooking at home. And it doesn't have to be that you're cooking the healthiest meals in the world. You don't have to switch your mashed potatoes for cauliflower. But it's the fact that you didn't get get takeout, you know, four times a week, Mm -hmm. essentially. And a big motivator to do that is the cost. I mean, seeing the groceries are already expensive, but like me making bread at home is because white bread's up to four dollars a loaf now. Mm. And it's like I can make a loaf of bread for like a dollar. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a time commitment, but the savings on takeout versus eating meals at home and then just controlling what you put in it. Obviously, like we try to limit like takeout to like once a week. And that is good for me in that I get a night off from cooking. It's good for Colin in that we're not eating the worst food every night of the week, basically. I think a lot of stuff, too, just comes down to people thinking it's harder than it actually is. Like, I remember the first time I had roasted broccoli at a family party, and I was like, well, this is, this is like stupidly good for how easy it is. It's just broccoli, a drizzle of olive oil, salt, pepper, I put a little garlic powder on it. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's that fucking easy. You put it in the oven for 20 minutes and it's done. But the reality is that some of this stuff seems intimidating if you've just never done it before. Now I make roasted veggies all the time. And it's just like, it's so stupidly easy. But it's it's an upgrade from if you're used to only ever making like steamed veggies, you know, obviously it adds a little bit of calories. But the point being that for me, something sustainable in terms of healthy eating, if you can make it taste good without making it completely unhealthy, that's that's the winner, right? Yeah. And, and two, I grill a lot. Like when, when Dagan talks about, oh, like Helene could be vegetarian. It's like, couldn't do it, man. Mm -hmm. I saw some short ribs at Publix yesterday that I wanted to buy so bad, but I didn't have, I was like, I got to record today, so I can't make them. Dude, eating meat is so natural. It's totally natural. Oh, I can't, I couldn't live without it. But it's the other thing is just, I'm a grilling enthusiast. I'm a barbecue enthusiast. So like, I couldn't give up steaks, but trying to make it healthier of like, if I'm making steaks on the grill, then I'm going to grill some asparagus. I'm going to grill some Brussels sprouts, whatever. Try and just always have a veggie. You know, that's that's honestly one of the bigger things is just because in terms of I tell Colin sometimes like not that I've ever done Weight Watchers, obviously, but in experience of friends and family who have done Weight Watchers and it's like veggies don't count. And so like when we do our big salad night, for example, and it's like just really like load up on the lettuce, load up on carrots and all that stuff. We always put chicken on top. I make boiled eggs and I make like a homemade dressing. But it is, it's like you can really eat so much vegetables without it being a problem. And so I try to make big portions of veggies. If I'm making spinach, if I'm making kale, I try to make like a real big portion if I'm making peas so that we can really like load up on that. In and have less carbs essentially because like I'm never going to give up carbs but if you take a bigger portion of the veggies you know it's just all about kind of doling it out that way and you've discovered that Dustin and you know one thing that you'll notice as you go on is eventually you won't need to count your calories so specifically because you'll memorize like I can eat this Mm -hmm. much of this like once you get a handle on what that portion size looks like that's when you're able to say like I don't actually need to count this so much as I know I can have this much rice, this much chicken, because it seems intimidating for a lot of people to count calories, but you're not stuck like that forever. You just need to learn the habit and, right. you know, stay consistent with new foods. But eventually, like, you know now how much that pizza is worth. So it's like, all right, well, I can have this many slices. And you, after a while, I don't have to think about it. Right. So I think you're making all the right moves, Dustin. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I think you're doing great. Thanks. Yeah. The, the thing about the pizza that I thought about afterwards it's like no i can still eat four pieces of pizza in my future uh i just need to not like eat something insanely stupid for lunch also (laughs) and then eat something (laughs) stupid later at 11 o'clock at night right and i'm glad you brought up cooking uh I, i think we've done a cooking topic on this show but cooking is one of those things that i feel bad when people hate it because i find so much joy from cooking and don't get me wrong there's some nights where like fuck i gotta make something and or whatever and and it can be annoying but like recently so one of my my tricks for this diet session we'll say is doing the meal prep uh for lunches 
and I've discovered I I brought up Chipotle earlier is that I'm making like mock Chipotle bowls at home and I can make the whole week at once and they're 500 calories and they reheat awesome and they taste amazing. And there's a lot of things like that you can make that it's like, yeah, just because it's lower calorie doesn't mean it sucks, especially if you make it yourself. Uh, and that's been a really rewarding aspect of it. And just figuring out those those little things uh, that you can do in order to succeed. And yeah, cooking is a big part of it. Dude, it sucks. One last comment. I know we've been talking on this for a while, but I hate it how and this is just how our society is. But if you want to eat healthy, just exp- your grocery bill is going to go up like it is yeah. more expensive yeah, to eat, eat well. And it sucks that that's the reality. And there are ways around it. Um, Like you, you could eat healthy and probably keep your grocery budget the same, but it's probably going to be boring (laughs) and it's probably not going to be as good. Um, Like buying frozen vegetables instead of fresh stuff and things like that. But just unfortunate that, you know, getting a, a cheeseburger from McDonald's might be a dollar like if you get a dollar menu stuff it's like a dollar fifty two dollars yeah it's, you know? it's yeah. disappointing too because a lot of it's not true really about a lot of like more boutique level um like produce but a lot of produce is artificially expensive like things like corn would be virtually free if not for government the government and there's a great documentary you can watch on this called king oh. corn probably 15 years old now or whatever but where they go into like the government basically pays farmers not to sell this shit and like not to grow it and all that kind of stuff to keep prices high because we can because in the we have such an amazing advantage in the United States that we don't need to import food. We yeah. do, but we don't have to. And we don't have to import very much like we we have everything from oranges to almonds to wine to fields yeah. of wheat and corn mm-hmm. to everything. Like there's very little we need to get overseas and so I think that 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 kind of thing keeps pr- food prices that are not manufactured higher to keep farmers in the black it's all kind of fucked up a lot of interesting stuff about that out there because it does suck that you because these companies buy wheat at mass to make lucky charms or whatever and then yeah i don't know it's it's just it it does suck and thanks joe biden because it's way more expensive now than ever we talk about it constantly when we were we and again we're not i can only dude i can only imagine how horrifying it is out there if you have if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're dealing with these increased food bills. When I when I go into the supermarket, Micah, our division of labor has Micah doing the shopping and the cooking for the most part, pretty much all of it. And it's much appreciated. But when I see every once in a while, because I like going to the BJs especially, but when I go to Publix or something and I'm like, damn, dude, what? Oh, you, I still have my, and, and my memory. I used to, I remember these things being like literally 30 percent as much. Well, I life, told you, you know, yesterday. So we try to buy uh, like Pepsi. I try to always buy it at BJ's because it's just a way better price there. But I knew I wasn't going to get there today because we had to record. So I just bought a 12 pack at Publix. It was nine twenty nine for a 12 pack of Pepsi. And it's like, I just can't fathom it. Like, it's crazy. Publix, is because just, it's nice, but it's it's pricey. And the thing is, it's just our closest grocery store. It's like right, I it's could right drive yeah. 15 more minutes to go to a different grocery store. But then it's like, well, now I'm tacking on an extra half hour to the shopping. You know, it's just like it's one of those things of like you, your own value of time. I don't mind Basically, paying more, too. I like, like man, this is nuts. I, I do, like it is a nice store. Yeah, I don't it's mind. beautiful supermarket. And yeah. not everything is crazy. Like normal stuff like pasta and all that is the same price at Publix as it is at Wegmans. But it's little things like that. of like, man. A twelve pack of Pepsi for nine over nine dollars. Like yeah. thanks, Joe Budden. Dude, you gotta <laughs> Street's know, number one draft pick. Go I know Colin <laughs> doesn't like this. You guys, I'm pretty sure you guys got an Aldi real close. Yeah, real we do. It's right next to Wawa. Yeah. Oh, it is behind the Wawa. I, I I've never been to it. I, I'm not against Aldi, but the thing for me is that it is not one stop shopping because mm. in my experience, Aldi does not always have reliable produce. I don't mean that it's not good. I've gotten really great fruit at Aldi, but sometimes you go and the the produce is looking sad. Oh. And other weeks it's really great. Hmm. And that's just been my experience of it's some like and maybe in your local Aldi just might be better. Yeah. But it's been my experience that Aldi has inconsistent produce. And then it's like, okay, well, I wanted to get all the food at once. Now I have to go to a different store if I want to get 
vegetables today. Right. And and that happened like BJ's, for example, their produce is trash. Um, literally fruit flies everywhere. The potatoes yeah. are always soft. Like you don't buy produce at BJ's. It's not good. I think just not enough people buy it because that it's shit's going bad. But when I structure out my grocery shopping and it's like, if I want to get everything in one go, Publix is the answer or Wegmans. But Wegmans is like a half hour away. So I'm only there from on that side of town. So right. the unfortunate thing with Aldi is just, it's not as convenient when I go and I'm like, well, the broccoli looks like shit today. So I can get everything except produce. Wegmans is a, is a classy place. I only go there when I'm visiting my parents. Uh, that's where me and my dad will get beer. <laughs> Speaking mm-hmm. of health. Mm-hmm. Oh, we'll go to Wegmans. Beer, yeah. They've got a great selection. They and really do. Yeah, they have a Wegmans bar at this one in Alexandria. Really? They have a bar there, that. and I always joke. I'm like, dude, I want to get shit face at the Wegmans bar. <laughs> Pick a fight with some mom. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Totally. Sounds like yeah, a great time. It, I usually call it Weggy Boys. I'll be like, I'm going down the Weggy Boys. Sometimes I call it Schmegmans. Schmegmans. But, you know, but I, I, I do like. It's a good store. It's a very good store. Schmegmans. It's so gross. Schmeg- Oh. oh yeah, no. Sometimes I call it Schmeggy Boys. So, it's just the Schmeg Boys. Names. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Michael. Let's stick with you. Final topic. I leave it to you. Right. So this came up uh, expiration dates because Dagan mentioned on a recent episode writing the date on the milk that he, you know, the date he opened it. Oh yeah. And so this just jogged my brain of. I want to know how everybody feels about expiration dates because we all make jokes about like our parents, for example, keeping Oreos that are two years old and saying they're fine. And, you know, my stance is always, I'm not saying it's going to kill me. I'm saying it tastes bad. All right. Mm -hmm. If you bring out a pack of Oreos from two years ago, I'm not saying that I'm afraid of them. I'm saying they're not going to taste good and they don't, you know, that's my kind of dealio with expiration dates is, I generally follow them for, it It depends on the item. Something like milk it usually doesn't last long enough. Like if it, that to go past the date, it often starts to smell before the date in my experience. And maybe that's just the milk we buy, but it's like, I don't ever keep milk past the date. Cause every time, mm-hmm. if I open it and it smells bad, I'm getting rid of it. I don't care what the date says. No, me neither. Stinks, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not drinking it past the date. Fuck it. No, exactly. Ugh. And usually it already smells bad like the day or two before, so it's gone. But I do stick to expiration dates depending on the item. Crackers that are sealed are going to be fine, you know, a little past the date. But if they have been opened and they've already gone stale, like just get rid of them. But, you know, it's I'm very fanatical about canned goods. Which I know, like, you watch The Last of Us and they're eating, like, 20 year old Chef Boyardee. But, like, if the can, like, I don't fuck around with dented cans. All right. Mm. I'm at the grocery store. I am molesting each can to make sure that they're smooth and, you know, unbroken. All right. They got to be perfect cans for me to bring them home. I watch people just throw them in their cart like it's nothing. I'm like, you got a dented can right there. Yeah, like, totally I saw it. it doesn't pay. So, time. like, I'm fanatical about dented <laughs> cans because I don't, I'm not trying to die of botulism or whatever. And expiration dates, I always just take a peek first, you know, like my dad shopping at the grocery store hardly glances at the dates unless it's like the meats. And I'm like, don't you care that that box of crackers is going to go off in a month? Get the one behind it. That's good for six months. You know, I'm always checking that stuff. But I I don't know. Our parents seem collectively to not give a fuck about expiration dates. And I'm also, when it comes to things like... um, even just keeping track of things like Dagan does, the dog food, canned dog food really shouldn't be in the fridge more than four days. I just pop a little date on it when I open it. I, it never lasts that long, but I just like to be sure of when I opened it because I want my, my pups to get sick because they can't talk to me. They can't tell me what's going on. <laughs> Human food, same same deal for depending on what it is. Like some um, chicken broth, like in the carton. You're supposed to use it within two weeks. I just pop a little date on that because I'm I'm don't I don't mess around with that stuff. You know I've never gotten food poisoning in my life. Knock on wood, and I don't plan to. So I'm just careful about that stuff. I'm not throwing away stuff the day after I open it. But if it says used within two weeks, I'm gonna follow it. You know I'm generally speaking I'm gonna follow the rules. So uh, I want to start Dustin. Yeah. We're around the same age. I want to know how you and Holly kind of operate within your household. Cause some of this too is just, we're all married. Some of this is going to be like, how do we operate 
shopping with another person too because we're not just living on our own here yeah well i first got to touch on you said about parents not caring about (laughs) expiration dates and stuff like that my dad was the is the well i say was he is because he still does this he's the type of guy that he'll pull out the bread to make a sandwich and one of the pieces might have like a little not like insane mold but it might have a little something on it he'll just rip that off and uh (laughs) make a sandwich he Heinous. doesn't your care. dad he I'm ate like, those chicken wings that were out overnight he was like just oh, nuke yeah. them a little extra oh, whoa and he was fine yeah but so- i that's another thing like not an expiration date but like i stick to my like serve safe training of like food needs to be put away within a few hours or it's not good anymore like i stick to that right so for anyone who doesn't know the context of that before sacred 200 uh, the morning of well, the night before we got barbecue, which was awesome. It was like me and Ben and Holly. We were really all at, at your place. And uh, my dad shows up the next morning to help us because we got to load up all the merch, uh, which is funny. Uh, yeah. My, the, thinking about my dad being at your house it was that was just a weird <laughs> mix of people at a weird place. You know what I mean? But the wings yeah. were left out. And we we're like, oh, yeah, you probably shouldn't eat that because we were like eating the leftovers before we had to leave. He's like, oh, I'll just I'll just nuke them extra. You know, like a little, little extra microwave. That wouldn't really bother me either if they were just out like overnight or whatever. Yeah, that wouldn't bother, that wouldn't bother me if they were cooked already. Yeah. That's so a- I, I'm trying to think. I think that I that would be in the category that you have, Micah, where I would be okay eating the wings that were left out overnight from a health perspective. But the those boys are going to be dry AF, be and especially if you out. if you heat them up extra, it's done for. Uh, so I wouldn't do it personally, but <laughs> yeah, I think of the, I'm kind, we're kind of in the same realm as you, Micah, where it really is dependent on on the thing where there are certain things that once you open them, for example, I always fuck up with bacon. If you open bacon and you cook it a little bit, you really have a short window once it's open, yeah. because once the air hits, it's going to start looking weird. And it's like, ah, I should have made that two days ago and even though it's not expired because it's opened you know it doesn't it's not good right i did have a really bad experience of accidentally drinking something that was bad once which Uh wasn't even i think unhealthy i this was like a year ago i was having some heartburn late at night and sometimes when that happens what i would do is i would drink some almond milk uh, because i read online that's supposed to be good I took it does, a dr- yeah actually uncle mike drinks almond milk every night before bed because it's it is good for heartburn i yeah it, it's great yeah it it doesn't it doesn't taste like regular milk at all but it doesn't it doesn't taste bad to me either right and when i took a drink of it there's something about the almond milk that it like congeals together it does it tastes yeah. like if if there was like a snot sneeze in the drink <laughs> and the <laughs> moment that it passed my lips it wasn't even about it didn't taste weird. I like immediately had to spit it out. I almost threw up just by the 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 consistency of what happened. I thought never, never again. And so since that day, I've been permanently scarred where I'm always checking how how old is this almond milk? Because I cannot yeah. have that happen again. That's an item that almond milk will be dated far out, but depending on brand like i buy almond breeze and it says to use it within 14 days and it's true that it will start to get lumpy past that point Ugh. and it's like it's not gonna hurt you probably but it is just not good Ugh. so like i do i i do write the date on the almond milk because i don't want to ruin a cup of coffee if i just dump it in and it's oh, it was, this has been open for three weeks and i usually can get through one in two weeks but like if I don't now, I know, like, just get rid of that last half inch of milk. It ain't worth it. Yeah. The bringing back my dad, I remember his thing always. Cause I was like, I don't know if I want to eat this or if we should make this. And he's like, well, does it smell bad? Yeah. <laughs> no, nope. it does ta- pass the smell test. Go for it. It's good. So it's fine. Yeah. It's like gross. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm not. Doing uh, but that. it's and you know what? It's, it's got to be smell and touch because meat, mm. you know, meat might pass the smell test. But if it is like slimy or discolored, then that's also still a no go. I've learned a lot like about selecting meats ever since I started grilling more. And like my dad's helped a lot with that. That is something I had to overcome a little bit of my like 
you know, expiration date bias of like, no, these steaks are perfectly good so long as they pass these like three criteria. And then also saying sometimes something might be several days before the Best Buy date and it's already gone bad. Like you can't trust the date either, like implicitly. You do still have to say like, no, this meat fucking stinks. It doesn't matter if it says it doesn't go off for three days. Yeah, it's a meat in particular. I'm a little more skeptical, uh, probably even more than Holly. Sometimes she's like, it's fine. I'm like, there's something about some don't feel right. You know, so it doesn't (laughs) smell bad. It doesn't look bad. It doesn't feel something. Something is grossing me out before i before i end off here i got it we got to give a shout out to our boy steve mre info you're talking about oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. shout out shout dude if anyone's <laughs> seen this channel steve our mre info he opens he eats mres from um uh, all the wars i would say yeah. i think there was one he had that was like borderline civil war like right after like one of the oldest <laughs> available it was like <laughs> dust but he still will always like, you know, give a little try. He smokes the cigarettes that are in there. <laughs> no way. Yeah, dude, cool. this dude yeah, he's rules. great. You'd love him. Oh, I got to no, watch this. It's his like they're amazing videos. But also, too, you made me think of um, it's Brad tries and he ate like a 30 year old Reggie bar. And that video kills me because it's just this bar is essentially turned into drywall at this yeah. point. And it's not good. And just watching this man suffer through eating a 30 year old candy bar. That's amazing. Dude. But I didn't like and I wouldn't be able to do that mentally. I don't think I could. I don't think I could even take a bite unless it was like a survival situation. I don't think you could get me to eat something that was 30 years old. Dude, Steve, our MRE info. First of all, he'll always say, let's get this out on the tray and they'll jump. Mm-hmm. Yes. Nice. Nice. <laughs> he always says nice. The second thing that's great about him is that he will describe a Vietnam ration like he is drinking a fine wine. Like he'll like yeah. he'll be like having some of the the corned beef or whatever and be like, mm, it's like some some subtle sweetness actually in there. This is uh this is so great. The stuff they were eating, you know, it's a little, you know, like amazing channel. Anyway. You would uh, like the uh, have you run into a, a parallel channel? So there's a guy we watch post 10 who goes around like New England and undoes yeah. beaver dams and shit like that. And it's like hysterical, but he does a so he then he did this spin-off channel. And post ends like mega popular for that. And then like or like clogged drains and like lakes, he like go and like undo them. Oh, and yeah, then, yeah. And so he does a, a parallel channel called New England Wildlife or something oh, like that. And I think I've heard of this. Yeah. And he eats mega old things he finds in like basements in Maine. So I've seen this like hundred year old like pork and beans and shit like that it's hysterical yeah it's the good dude's shit. gonna die yeah. that sucks <laughs> okay here's the the big video on his channel that has 1.4 million is opening and tasting very old spam meat yeah yeah exactly <laughs> spam might actually I, it, it might be such that it gets better the longer it's in there you know who knows oh, yeah, yeah, a little, it, a little aging might. better with age um here i'm gonna leave it here with I, I expiration dates here's the thing i'm not eating anything after an expiration date don't serve it to me. If I if you if you serve me something knowingly and it's past an exp- expiration date, I, I feel it's an affront to me if you do that. And what I want to do is just make fun of some people in our family because and this is something that I get really annoyed about, actually, is that and it, two people do it really and places we actually congregate a lot, which is mom and Uncle Mike, where mm. like things will just drinks will just stay in because f- there's like each of these places has like 17 fridges for some reason right like in the in the garage and stuff like that and they're like oh go to the garage and we'll get it and it's like all of this shit is out of date like throw this stuff away i find it so obnoxious that people try to foist that shit on you and i know that it's probably not doing knowingly but a lot of times it's like oh it's totally fine blah 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 and i'm like throw out the old drinks and get new drinks if you're going to entertain people like I, and it's so awkward to be in those kinds of situations where you're like, everything's expired. What do you want me to do here? Like, it's, I'm not drinking a year old Pepsi. I'm not right. drinking. They don't drink it, but they have it. Right. I'm like, I'm not drink. And dad does this. I don't know how much. I think he still does it because I think he, Dana told me that he tried to foist like a three year old Oreo on on the boys oh, like last time they were there or something. Oh, that's but a bad move for sure. It's like 100%. It was so it this is true and I'm bummed because I left it in San Francisco. I forgot I had it. It was in the kitchen because when I left, I none of that stuff in the kitchen was mine. So I just didn't even really go through anything. But Dad had these spices that he was straight up using from the 70s. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and eventually <laughs> I was like, I turned them over. They were like in metal tins. And I was like, dude, it says sell by 1981 on here. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it's 2012 oh, yeah. or whatever. And he eventually sent me those as a joke, which I thought was really funny. And then I, I left them there. But I was like, dude, I'm, I can't believe we're, it's not the road. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. right. Spices, though, because I'll, I'll, I don't know. Maybe you'll divorce no. me. I do cook sometimes with expired spices. Do not expired from before I was born. I was eating food in no. my 30s that had spices in it from before I was born. It's different. That's fine if, no, if the peppery is expired. No, they was about a year old. That's fine. It's like whatever, <laughs> dude. That's different than the kind of shit that my dad was trying to pull. And it's the same oh, yeah. thing with like the canned goods and the pep. Anyone who drinks Coke and Pepsi knows that it does not taste right if it's expired. It's gross. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't age right. Everyone knows that it's weird that people put others in positions where you have to explain that to people. The same with beer. You know? Oh, yeah. Where oh, yeah. aged beer thing was a problem. Yeah, it's like <laughs> beer skunks and doesn't taste good after a while. And I, I, I'm real. So we don't entertain very often just because we have probably the smallest house of everyone in our family to entertain. So it's like, what's the point of having people here? Um, but in the few times we do, I, I true try to be cognizant of that, like new drinks for everyone. What does everyone want to eat and drink? All that kind of stuff. No expired. Don't even worry about it. And then meanwhile, it's like, oh, yeah, go to buy the fridge by the pool has, you know, three year old Michelob lights in it. Cool. Um, so that's my experience these days with with expiration dates. But in my own life, I'm not eating expired food knowingly anyway. I mean, and if bread is expired, whatever, it's like, nope, bye, bye, bye. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it looks new or whatever. I'm not eating it. And you don't give it to the ducks. No, I don't want to attract any ducks around. I <laughs> Voice in the ducks. Uh, <laughs> we're not on Long Island. There are no ducks here. You know, oh, there are, uh, there's those ducks that come by the planted shallow marsh oh, every yeah, summer. Yeah. That, Flyovers. That, that pair of ducks. By the it's way, I have to respond here, to that, th- that thread dig that we, I, I, I were in a family thread and I was recording and then there was literally 92 posts in it when I came back. So I'm like, well, I'm not reading this right now. So, but Which I was, one? but I was scrolling through it and uh, where we're from on Long Island, it got like majorly flooded. Oh yeah. And, yes. and it's not a huge surprise. We grew up on the water, but I'm like, this Long Island's going away. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> yeah. I've was never like, seen it that bad. The beginning of the end, I think. Um, all right. Who have, Dig, we haven't heard from you on the expired food front yet. I suspect you're kind of a persnickety person. I would be really surprised if you ate expired food knowingly. Oh, yeah, he yeah, inspired you know the topic. Yep. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, because we were traumatized as kids. You know, we really were. I mean, I want to pick up where you left off with dad because I definitely see this as an opportunity to throw our dad under the bus. So sure. I'm going to go in that direction. But I'll tell you why it was so insidious with dad. Even as a kid, this is why he was so sneaky. Because there's the use by slash best by date on a product, but then there's the sell by date. And mm. he used the sell by date as armor. Like that was his shield from our ridicule and our scorn because he felt like the sell by date was a suggestion. It was like, yeah, but this says, it's like, dad, it's April. This expired in February. And he would say, well, that's a sell by date. And it would be like, he thought that easily bought him like a week or two. But then my argument would be like, okay, dad, it's not six weeks expired. It's only four weeks expired. Like, what's the difference? Bro, it's still go po- get another still can poison. of fucking Campbell's tomato soup. <laughs> it's poison. What dad. is it? Fucking 50 cents? <laughs> you know what's funny about the boomers? They didn't grow up during the day. I could understand a lot of people have anecdotes about my grandparents. They were in the depression and sort of their habits were formed out of that sort of period. Like the going through that sort of trauma or that. You know, that sort of those trials and tribulations. But our parents didn't go through that. They were born in the boom. I know. They you know, had like, it great. They, they had it great. Literally they? in the boom. <laughs> You're like, it was so, but he would do that. He would exploit that. That was like his sneaky Ugh. tactic. But Colin talking about the spice cabinet, I have three different anecdotes about the spice cabinet. I remember now, I don't remember from being a kid. But maybe it was the early 90s, uh, late 90s, early aughts. And dad would often have Thanksgiving. So Colin was in San Francisco. Let's say I was in Philly. We would all convene at my dad's house for that holiday. And then my dad would have some other people or whatever. I remember once we were dressing the turkey, like we were seasoning the turkey. We were going to put it in the oven. So I was helping my dad in the kitchen. And I took out, I guess what was like, it was sage. It was like an old thing of sage. And we had already formed this thing of knowing my dad's, he's going hard and fast with trying to get over on us with the spices. So I happened to look at this thing 
and it expired in like 91 and it was like 2002 right <laughs> so i'm like dad you know like literally this sage is like 11 years old and he was true story and he was like it's sage like it's not you know who can like he's no like he's a yeah plants don't go bad expert. yeah plants I'm like don't go dad bad. this sage yeah. is literally has become oxycontin like not only is this like like irresponsible it's illegal and possibly dangerous at this point like god knows what this thing has become and like manifested itself into the other thing was he had an old like McCormick tin. I don't know what it was. Like, let's say it was paprika or oregano or something. And I had, <laughs> you could just look at this thing from the color palette or the like very, really like, I don't know, like primitive printing on it. But I was like, dad, this was the McCormick logo, like five logo generations ago. Like this is pre, <laughs> this is like pre Madison Avenue. Like this is like industrial resolution, revolution, like McCormick. And I was, I literally said to him, dad, you could probably take this to an antique store and get enough money for this to replenish your entire spice rack. And then with the leftover money, like set up a trust fund for your grandchildren. <laughs> like this is an antique. <laughs> and the other thing was true story. Again, I don't know if it was like garlic salt or parsley flakes or something. He had a copper, an actual copper container. And then I was like, this is actually copper because you could see it the way it like, the you know, the way copper like. I don't know what's that, oxidation. Like it goes from being that gold color to like being like green, like the Statue mm -hmm. of Liberty. Yeah. And you could see it was doing that on the bottom. And then I had realized that dad, they stopped using copper for household products like in World War II. Yeah, this is like, like mega became, expensive. This is like $15 is this dollars of copper. <laughs> this predates you being married by 25 years. Like where is this stuff even from? I felt like, like that dad's spice rack. <laughs> was just this ongoing joke. I remember like to the point of it being with like drink the milk. It's only two, it's only two, you know, weeks old. Eat the meatloaf. I, I made it with fucking corn flakes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like cottage cheese, you know, it was like, it's oh, fine. God. That whole it's fine thing. When, see, I, even as a kid, I knew I was going to be a parent, right? I always wanted kids. So, when you go through that and you become a parent, you kind of swear, you make these like unwritten silent oaths. Like I'm not going to traumatize my kid like my parents traumatized me in so many ways. And then you kind of keep track of that. You itemize those things, right? And I'll be honest, when you're a parent and now I'm go a parent going on 17 years, you have some victories and some fails. Like there's certain things that I swore I wouldn't traumatize my kids with that my parents did to me that I absolutely did to my kids too. But one thing I was like, you don't really want to poison your kids, though. I mean, sometimes you do, <laughs> but you don't actually want to poison them. So I swore that I would never serve my kids outdated stuff because it was such a, it was, you know, it was a thing. Totally, it was totally and that is one victory for me. I never had my kids once look at something and be like, this is out of date. Or if they did find it before me, I'd be like, just chuck it. So that was a win. I could chalk that one up in the W column. But like that was one thing I, I definitely stopped the cycle, you know, of trauma with because dad's still like that. No, he totally is, dude. That's what I was saying with uh, <laughs> condiments is another thing where I'm like, dude, this ketchup is six years old. You think I'm going to eat this ketchup? Like, what is wrong? Like, wh and I, I remember specifically going home in my 20s to like spend Christmas or whatever. I was going to be there for like a week and a half or something. And I'm like, can we please go to the supermarket? And I think, we, and we went together and I think he was just, oh, I was going to get odds and ends, but I was getting like all the fundamentals. And he's like, what do you need? And I'm like, dad, I, you and I both know that you bought mayonnaise eight years ago. And it's, <laughs> and it's the mayonnaise because our dad, it's important to note that our dad is like a very healthy eater and just doesn't eat the yeah, shit. No mayo. So like he's anything died. that's like not good for you is not, is not his anyway. Right. But knowing and, and I haven't really been home in a while and I've, I haven't been to the island since 2019. And uh, and I don't really consider like dad's new house our home. So I'm not going to go through his stuff now. But like the house he used to live in was our home. And I would dig through it. And I'd be like, dude, this shit. I swear to God, this bottle of Pepsi has been here since I was in high school. Like, you know, <laughs> and I don't understand. So going to the store and, and, and being like, 
you see these things, people make fun of them in memes sometimes where I'm like, I'm buying this stuff. I am at the time making $40,000 a year living with like seven people in a fucking shoebox and I can afford to go and buy fucking bread and mayonnaise. I just, that's the thing that it always comes back to for me is like, you weren't this hard up. You simply weren't (laughs) this hard up. So I do not understand why you subjected us to old cans of Campbell's soup, bread that's a week expired, frozen freezer burned this, fucking old spice. Like, what is this shit? Was it Throw worth it the away? Yeah, You're not. It was an epidemic. Dude, it like really they, was. the older I get, the more I realize mom and dad were not simply not in the financial situation they were pretending to be in. And no, not even close. No, not even close. There was no way. No, How? No, not, not, not even close. Like, it's totally real to me. Like we would, we were, first of all, we lived in a fucking 5,000 square foot house. Okay. Then we're being told that, it's like, oh, we McDonald's, you know, we can't, we're, we're, we're barely making ends meet over here. I'm like, we we're live strapped. in a fucking, <laughs> we live like a half a mile from the fucking beach in a mansion, basically. What is this? <laughs> very strange. You know, I, I don't, strange. I don't understand. I don't understand what's going So like, <laughs> that's, so what, many that's what fucking questions. pisses me off. You never hear those stories from people that I actually knew who were hard up. Like, you never hear that stuff. Oh, yeah, I, my, my parents didn't have two fucking nickels to rub together, and we ate the bread to the fucking rawest, grossest, moldiest part of the loaf. Like, you, you don't hear those. You only hear those stories from people from, like, Connecticut. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's like, true. I don't, I don't know, man. That that really, that, that, I'm so glad you have that promise with your kids, because that, that shit drives me nuts, because it is putting people, it's what I always say, don't put me in a situation. Right. I'm not going to put you in that. You will never you will never find yourself. And by the way, if you do find yourself in that situation, I will be so aghast. But in, when I'm in that situation, it's like, well, what do you mean? It's fine. It's like that was two years ago. Yeah, it's like, OK, great. You know, I'm going to starve to death, I guess, because I'm not eating this. Fucking Christ. Send me Micah, on a, there's on a, a secret diatribe. with milk. Have you Colin? You, we've talked about this before. I don't know when. I don't know where, but I think one of our listeners weighed in on this, but I forgot what the answer is. But I don't, and maybe you know this already, Micah, but for some reason, and again, there must be some answer or some science to this, but organic milk, it's very expensive. But my kids were raised all organic with the milk, with the baby formula on up, organic milk and then organic fruits and veggies and all that kind of stuff. We didn't do that before we had kids. And I don't think the FDA even had sanctioned organic products. They say it's like nothing, right? Like it's like you can, it's like kind of nonsense. It's it's largely a scam, but, and we, and we even knew that in the aughts, you know, when Lily was born 2007 on up, it was like, uh, how do you, but how do you not? Like that was kind of the way we looked at it, but organic milk, when we started drinking, it was like, this lasts a lot longer than if you pick up a gallon of regular milk at your Wawa or your sheets or your 7-Eleven. I don't know why it is, but, and I know a half a gallon of organic milk is like five bucks now. So it's pricey. It's a lot, it's double the price of regular milk, but for some reason it does last longer. So it might be worth it for you, depending on your milk, drinking habits, coffee, cereal, whatever. Well, right. Cause the, the milk, milk, like real milk is only for cooking and for if Colin wants cereal. So I always keep milk in the fridge on the off chance that he'll have a bowl of cereal or that I might make mac and cheese or mashed potatoes. You take good care of me. You're very good at that stuff. I try. I don't drink real milk ever, though, because I'm lactose intolerant. And it's just one of those things that like I have very lactose intolerance really is like a spectrum of I can eat certain foods like provolone cheese is out. Makes me feel terrible even if I take a lactose aid. It still makes me feel bad, but I can eat mozzarella. I can eat cheddar. So I, I know my limits. Like I can never have real ice cream again. I feel terrible even if I take the lactose pills. And so real milk is in that category of I certainly could never just drink it. The The minimal amount that I used to make like mashed potatoes really doesn't bother me or like mac and cheese, for example, because I use like a lactose free cheese kind of balances out with the milk. But yeah, it, it's only for cooking and cereal usage. But I definitely, I would try that for sure because sometimes it is just like the milk fucking stinks and it's <laughs> it's several days away from the date, but it's like, well, it already smells. No, definitely. So we're getting rid That's of true. it. And that, that just keeps happening. And our fridge is very cold. I keep the fridge very cold. It's another level of paranoia. And I have a thermometer in the fridge, so I know it's accurate. So don't come at me with that. There's a thermometer in the fridge and the freezer. 
because I monitor those temps every day. <laughs> is it fair to say that your aversion to milk is one of several spectrums that you're on? Oh, well, that's just rude. <laughs> My therapist said that I wasn't autistic because <laughs> I asked. Because, <laughs> you know, what happened was when I was 25, my mom's like, you know, I always thought you were autistic. And I was like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that at this Thanks, age? Mom. <laughs> do I want because I was like, do I get tested and find out what does that do for me? Then I'm just left with wondering. And so one day I just asked my therapist, I was like, my mom thinks I'm autistic. She's like, you're not. And she was like, you know, you're, you're different. It's like, I'm okay with being fucking weird. You're differently all right? abled. I'm, I'm all right with that, man. Like, I'm, I'm totally cool. And I'm not saying I would have been, like, upset if I was autistic. It's more like I was upset that my mom dumped that on me at 25. Because it's yeah. like, if you thought something was wrong with me when I was 10, we could have ironed that out <laughs> so so early. I thought and instead, you just let me fucking deal now. with it. <laughs> Not everybody like isn't that isn't that the theory now like everybody is somewhat on the spectrum however large yeah i think well hence the term i guess in some sense i everyone's everything now so i, I don't take many diagnoses very seriously to be pretty <laughs> honest parody um did we go through everybody are we satiated was that everyone oh yeah yeah everybody got i do want to make one final point is in line with this people who keep stuff in the freezer for fucking 15 <sighs> years and say it's still fine no. <laughs> it's the quality all right. I'm not saying it's dangerous. I'm saying the quality. I don't want to eat the steaks that my dad has had in the freezer oh. for five years. They're not dangerous. No, dad, you're right. Those steaks aren't dangerous. They're going to be fucking dry. Freeze a Get them out oh, of gross. here. It's like, like da dad would do that with bread a lot where he'd be like, oh, this bread's going to expire. I'm going to put it in the fridge. I'm like, well, I'm not eating nearly expired like you put like you put it in stasis and now it's gonna be like well, it's forever july 14th or something i do that yeah. with the bread but i'm the, the one who eats it i do if if i make homemade bread and i'm like this needs to be eaten today and there's half a loaf i'll slice it all and i freeze it because then i can just toast the individual slices okay. but i use it within a month and that's generally speaking i keep you know meats in the freezer but i always use them within two months just for quality. I know it's safe. I don't need a bunch of comments telling me like it's safe indefinitely. Yeah, but it sucks. Like yeah, ground beef that's bad. been in the freezer for six months tastes different. You can just, you can, because actually, so one time I made tacos with some frozen ground beef. It had only been in the freezer for a month. And I was like, this has a distinct taste. Spongy. And I realized it's because my dad exclusively, he keeps so much ground beef in the freezer as a kid. That was the flavor I was used to of it always being previously oh. frozen because I was like, these tacos taste like the tacos dad always made, but didn't make any sense. And I was just like, it's the frozen ground beef. That's the flavor. And once you're off of that, it's kind of like unacceptable. So I keep meats in the freezer, specific ones like uh, Italian sausage freezes incredibly well. You'll never notice that that's been frozen. But other things I'm like, it's about the quality. It's not about safety. It's about quality. Totally. Yeah. And that's why I think we are not yet in need of like a separate freezer in the garage or something. It's like, no, because I don't want to be freezing and not unless all we that. have a generator. Right. Exactly. I don't want to waste all that food if the power is to go out. Like if I don't have a generator to keep that baby running, I, I'd be heartbroken. The time that my uh, we had like a power outage at my apartment and the power was out for like 12 hours, everything in the freezer indeed thawed out and was mm. soft. I cried as I was throwing all that food away because I felt so bad wasting it. Like it was a terrible feeling. All right. Shall we roll? By the way, why does uh, I don't understand why our HOA insists on sending us emails when the office is going to be closed. Like, I don't care. No one sends me more emails than my fucking HOA. No idea. And we have a new HOA company. And I said this, I got, I think the our old HOA got, company got mad at me because I was like, can you just unsubscribe me from these like spam emails? And then I never heard from them again. So clearly I wasn't getting like any of the important emails. Now we have this new company and it's just back to square one. We'll just keep it there. Micah. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'll see you right after this. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm looking forward to going to dinner tonight. Yeah, me I already too. peeped the menu. They updated the menu uh, this month. Really? So. Do they sell Brussels sprouts? Yeah, they still got the Brussels oh, okay, sprouts. Good. I made sure. Good, 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 yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, good drinks there as well. I'm excited to be there tonight. Uh, Dagan, goodbye to you, my friend. Goodbye. It's good seeing everybody. We're running down. Helene and I are running to the beach for the weekend without the kids. Oh, it's exciting. Oh. oh. I'm excited. I'm genuinely beyond feeling bad for the kids. <laughs> I'm just like, we're out. Any second? Yeah, it's a long. It's Are they long staying by themselves? 
no, 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 they're not there yet. My God, no, they they get along. It's just that I'm not. That's some Lord of the Fly shit that I can't even wrap my head around. Dude, Dad used to leave me. Happen. Dad used to go see his girlfriend upstate and leave me alone when I was in like ninth and tenth grade for like three days at a time. Ninth or tenth grade, fifteen. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. That long at a time. Definitely. Yeah. Like for a weekend, you know. And now, he'd be like, he "Here's like forty dollars, and I'm I'll see you in a few days." <laughs> Okay, I was going to ask, did he give you cash? Did he fill the fridge up? Yeah, he would buy food and like leave me money. And I loved it because I was like, I'm, you know, I wasn't like, you know, 10th, 11th grade at this point. I mean, it was throughout high school, but yeah. Yeah. Because Lily is not afraid to Uber eat some shit at one in the morning. We, you know, I'm like, who, who the hell's not when I mean, she's here with her friends or they do it at their friend's house too. It's like one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, who the hell's outside? It's Uber Eats. We just ate. I just what we did. What what is going on? They they eat like hobbits. Yeah, it's like third dinner, fourth dinner. Right, it's right. like ridiculous. I love those days for sure. They would love it. They would love. Now they're going to their uh, my mom and pop up's house. Mm, my mom and yeah. pop up. I just don't want them to burn down the house or anything. No, like, totally. They get I totally along understand. Fine, they'd have a great time, but I'm not. No. Yeah, not can, we, can we just talk about the names we give grandpas like grandpa <laughs> fought in world war ii grandpa got you know shot survived all this stuff for the last decade of his life he's gonna be called pup pup <laughs> he's gonna be called Pupo. he was all right a nazi, like this is the shit POW. we do to grandpas <laughs> seriously though like grandpas will see some serious shit and it's like last 10 years he's peepa and he's Pee-paw fine is the be- he's fine with it Pee-paw. but <laughs> is pen is now mama and pup up that was something I had to get acclimated to because that's a that I thought that was a Philly thing, but Dustin, is that a Pennsylvania thing? Mm, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, maybe so that's it is Philly thing. Mom, mom, and pop, pop. Mom, mom, pop, pop. Fucking yeah. weirdos. <laughs> yeah, Dustin. Goodbye <laughs> to you. I never heard. Goodbye. Uh, the only thing I have to say is this is my first episode wearing these in ears, and it's a reminder that one of my ears is slightly different. Then the other ear, I'm reminded of this when I wear any kind of stuff that goes in your ear. I haven't thought about that in a while. And now it's going to bother me for a bit. It's yeah. like this. This one doesn't fit in. Quite you got to get custom this one does. Did they huh? give you multiple like ear tip things? Yeah. You just mismatch them. I need to. I need to mess with that. I seriously, I opened it and Colin saw me walk in the room when I had I'd, the, the mailman had just dropped it off. I thought. Just I'm just going in raw, really. Going in raw, these. bite the pillow. <laughs> yeah, just going in raw with these, and it, it worked out nicely. So, no the, regrets. The, the shot of Wicket when it just says bite the pillow, I'm going in raw, is like one of my favorite memes. <laughs> That's an old meme, but I love that one. Wicket W. Warwick. All right, my friends, let's get the hell out of here. It's good to be with you guys today. Good to be with all of you out there in the audience. Thank you so much for your love, kindness, and support of all things Last Stand Media on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Last Stand Media. LastStandMedia.store for merch. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. Constellation is a product of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 